And I think from a humanitarian point of view that the UK Government should think again on this. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 11830 in the name of Ruth Davidson on the Smith Commission. I'd invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Ruth Davidson to speak to and move the motion. Ms Davidson, you have 14 minutes or thereby, please. Thank you. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Smith Commission process was a remarkable feat of fast-forward constitutional reform. And as this Parliament debates its verdict for the first time today, let me state the facts. The proposals that were unveiled by Lord Smith, coming on top of those introduced by the Kalman Commission, will now create here one of the most powerful parliaments of its kind anywhere in the world. Absolutely. Powers that will ensure real responsibility exists for the way in which money is both spent and raised. Powers that will give the Scottish Government real choice over taxation and welfare. And powers that will make ministers accountable for their decisions. They are powers, Deputy Presiding Officer, that will end the tired old grievance politics that have dominated our debates for too long and will instead force our government to think about the taxpayers and businesses whose efforts pay their bills. Lord Smith and all the nominees are to be congratulated for reaching this deal. It will secure the foundations for a more powerful and responsible parliament, a parliament that doesn't just spend tens of billions of pounds of hard-earned money, but also a parliament that has to think about where that money comes from, the taxpayer. There will be more decisions made in Scotland, but also we keep those crucial binding elements of the union, the state pension, the single market, the shared currency. We keep those because the people of this nation instructed us to do so. I've said before in this chamber, and I say again now, the only fixed constitutional settlement on the ballot in September was independence and it was expressly rejected by the voters of this country. So now, under Smith, we will be able to choose. We'll be able to choose to raise taxes or to cut them, to spend more on welfare or, to, or on transport or on anything else. Big decisions on fracking, on whether to lower the voting age, on the tax we pay at our airports, all to be devolved. We know it will take time for those reforms to come into practice, but what surely cannot now be doubted is the political will to bring them in. Um, between the two of you, gentlemen, I'll give way to one. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, like uh, the member, I very much welcome new powers for this place. Uh, does she assert that we will be more powerful than the provinces of Canada, the states of the United States, the lander of Germany, the states in Australia, and, and the point is can she tell us any tax in any of these places that we can't assert, but she won't have to look very far. <laughs> I'd Davis. like to thank the member for his intervention. I welcome uh, his welcome for the Smith Commission powers. Um, and I tell him that I don't need to assert anything. As I said on Thursday uh, at First Minister's Questions, we asked the independent information service of this very yeah. parliament, Mr Stevenson, to look at the point that he raised, and they came back showing that even federal countries like Germany, like uh, the lender in Germany, like the states in the United States, would not have the powers over tax raising or tax spending that this, uh, this legislature would have, not at this time. Uh, so let's have a look at the draft clauses. Let's look at the timetable of this, because we know that the draft clauses fleshing out the heads of the agreement will be produced by the 25th of January, meeting the next phase in our commitment to the people of Scotland. I am pleased that the Secretary of State has already brought together a team of leading officials in the Scotland Office, in HM Treasury, in the Department for Work and Pensions and the Cabinet Office. Their task is now to work together to ensure that we get a representative, coherent piece of legislation that delivers. And I hope everyone in the Chamber will also welcome and acknowledge that this team will remain in place after the general election to ensure that these plans move forward into law no matter the results in May. I, for one, uh, just in one second, I for one add my support to ensuring that where possible the reforms we have backed should be devolved as soon as practically possible. And in particular, 16 and 17 year olds in Scotland have caught the democratic bug and I want to see them in the polling booths again in 17 months time. I give way to the Cabinet Secretary. John Swinney. Grateful to Ruth Davidson for giving way. I wonder if she could set out whether she believes that um, all of the proposals need to be delivered in one legislative instrument, 
or whether she believes there is an argument to continue, as she set out a moment ago, that if there is a case for 16- and 17-year-olds' votes to be de devolved early, is there a case for other powers to be devolved early if they do not require primary legislation? Well, I think Davidson. if we use the Scotland Act 2012 as our template in, in, in this in terms of constitutional change, what we saw was a single uh, legislative instrument but that, that, that transferred powers at different times through that single legislative act. Now, first of all, I would like to say that I am pleased with the way that the pro-union parties have delivered. In September, I, along with Willie Rennie and with Joanne Lamont, jointly supported a timetable for reform. On the morning of the 19th, the Prime Minister announced that Lord Smith of Kelvin would chair an all-party deal to crack on. In October, the command paper was published well ahead of schedule. In November, the Smith Commission produced its report as promised. That is a record of delivery and commitments honoured, and it contrasts, I suggest, with the way in which the SNP has behaved. On the 20th of September, as this process was already underway and as the SNP themselves were being included in that process, Alex Salmond claimed that we were reneging on commitments and he accused us of shameless behaviour. We then had an untypically graceless performance from the Deputy First Minister at the launch of the report he'd signed just the night before. We had the new First Minister tweeting lines she didn't like and standing in the chamber to decry it as, and I quote, disappointing. And then we had this pathetic spectacle of three elected SNP councillors setting fire to the document yeah, itself exactly. outside their council chambers. Yeah. Signed it on Wednesday, whined about it on Thursday and burned it on Tuesday. <laughs> that is not the actions of a party dealing in good faith. And I know the SNP lines on this. They say that the vow wasn't honoured. Somehow they insist that the people of Scotland were let down, when what they really mean is that Smith is not full independence, so it is to them and them alone who feel aggrieved. And again I say, independence was specifically rejected by the people of this country. They want devolution to work. We're making that happen, not at this time, and the SNP would be unwise in the extreme to place roadblocks to that development or to create straw men to knock down. And I would also add that their complaints are misplaced. They're also staggeringly hypocritical. Because had the outcome been different in September, the SNP would, right now, be trying to explain how their promises on the economy could withstand an oil price which is nearly half what they claimed it would be. The IFS had stated that their figures already contained a £6 billion black hole, so the mind boggles at what would have happened when their fantasy economics collided with the reality of a volatile oil market. So on the subject of the SNP's response to Lord Smith, I must also express disappointment at the Nationalist Amendment to our motion today. Today was an opportunity for all five parties to back a path forward exactly. following the Commission's proposals. Yep. And we welcome the Liberal Democrat Amendment calling for more devolution within Scotland. Instead, the SNP has chosen to rewrite her motion. And it has done so purely, it seems, because they object to the use of the word significant to describe the new powers coming our way. It's pretty risible stuff, and I'm afraid it betrays once again the ideological blinkers of this nationalist government. Well, let me tell you, the complete control over income tax bans and rates, with money raised returning directly to the Scottish Government, is significant. The assignment of VAT is significant. Yep. Yep. Increased borrowing powers are significant. Yep. Devolution over air passenger duty and the aggregates levy are significant. Yep. In welfare, the power to top up any existing benefit is significant. Yep. The power to create any new benefit it likes in any devolved area is significant. The devolution of attendance allowance and disability benefits are significant. Variations of housing benefit are significant. Oh, I've got a long list and I'm still going, so not at this time. The devolution of the work programme, the largest welfare-to-work programme in UK history, is significant. Powers over elections, including changing the voting age, are significant. Devolution of the Crown Estate is significant. Devolution of tribunals, rail franchising and of British Transport Police are significant. And the power over fracking is significant. So I look forward to any SNP MSP proving me wrong today, and that includes Mark Macdonald, to just one of them having the good grace to stand up and say that this package of powers is a significant package. Will the member?
we have been Donald. quite clear that we welcome new powers coming to this Parliament. But the member, the member must accept that a range of organisations from Civic Scotland have expressed that they are underwhelmed by the proposals. The member talks about those with blinkers. Surely by suggesting it is only the SNP who are disappointed at the extent the Smith Commission proposals go to when there is that feeling in Civic Scotland is a classic example of the unionists wearing their blinkers. Ruth I reject that entirely. Smith took um, measures and, and submissions from people right across the land. It took submissions from the Institute, for example, of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, who specifically rejected corporation tax, in the way, same way the STUC did, in the same way as many other organisations did. So I don't accept the member's point at all. So let's move on to the proposals themselves, because the challenge just now is to spell out how these new responsibilities will be used. And it is a massive challenge for us all. All 128 members, every party and the government itself now needs to add to our skill set so that we are ready to make the best use of our expanded role. On tax and spending, the challenge is enormous. Instead of simply banking the annual cheque, it will be for this Parliament to decide how it manages its own account. This brings with it serious choices. I want to make progress. From Labour and the SNP, for example, we hear already calls to increase income taxation. That will be their choice and one that they can take to the electorate of this country. For my part, my priorities will be simple. Firstly, I want to reduce the taxes that we will be responsible for. Earlier next year, the Scottish Conservatives will launch our Low Tax Commission. This will examine how we can better use the basket of taxes which we will soon have control over. And it will advise us how best we go forward as a dynamic low tax nation. Secondly, we will support all moves to grow the tax base. The GERS Scotland figures show that per head of population, our income tax receipts in Scotland are lower than the UK as a whole. Get those receipts up to UK levels, however, and nearly £2 billion more per year would flow into the Scottish Government's coffers. That creates a real incentive for this Government to do so. And with half of all VAT assigned here too, there is also an incentive to grow retail sales and support Scottish businesses who make and sell things. That is the prize on offer if we drive our economy forward, and that prize, I would suggest is significant. We will also face big challenges on how we use the new welfare powers. Again, we will no doubt differ on our approach to how those powers should be used. I support reform of our welfare system that gives help and encouragement to people to get back to work and which cuts the country's benefits bills. The SNP opposes that reform. I back a cap on the amount any one family can claim in welfare. The SNP says they want to lift that cap. I believe you shouldn't be able to claim more in benefits than the average family earns through work. The SNP does not agree. And the choices facing ministers here are immense. The new personal independence payment system is to be devolved to the Scottish Government. The work programme will also be devolved. In addition, ministers will be able to propose entirely new benefits if they so wish. In much the same way as the Scottish Government has chosen to eliminate the spare room subsidy in Scotland, so it will have the power to act in other areas too. They could offer a resettlement benefit for pensioners leaving jail, a payment to loan parents in parts of Scotland who need childcare, even a Scottish winter wind and rain allowance for days like today. They may choose all or indeed none of these things, but again the choice is there to be made. Now, this will take time to implement. Switching over complex benefit system, systems to the Scottish Government, which does not currently have the technical infrastructure to support those mechanisms, means that capacity has to be built. And this is something that we need to do right. And we need the Scottish Government to act in good faith to ensure that capacity is built and the transition is a smooth one. Publishing his proposals last month, Lord Smith rightly described the Commission's work as an unprecedented achievement. He added, and I quote directly, it demanded compromise from all of the parties. In some cases, that meant moving to devolve greater powers than they had previously committed to. While for other parties, that meant accepting the outcome would fall short of their ultimate ambitions. It shows that, however difficult, our political leaders can come together, work together and reach agreement with one another. I believe he was right in that assessment. I believe also that voters in Scotland expect us to agree something else too. That it is time, that it is in fact well past time for us to focus on the powers that we have and those that are coming rather than stoke false grievance on those staying reserved. Absolutely. People in Scotland gave us their decision. They want a powerful Scottish Parliament that remains within rather than is separate from the United Kingdom. 
The work put in by the Smith Commission means we have the tools to deliver on that verdict. So let's get on and use them. I move the motion in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on John Swinney to speak to and move Amendment 11830.2. Deputy First Minister, you have ten minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I do seem to have offended uh, Ruth Davidson in the formulation of the Government's amendment today and in the comments that I have made on the subject, I, though I find the, her exception taken to the comments that I have made on the subject rather strange, since I uh, opened my remarks to the uh, gathering at the National Museum of Scotland and welcomed the additional powers that are coming to the Scottish Parliament. And, pointed out the limitations of the settlement, which is exactly the point that Ruth Davidson has just made, uh, which Lord Smith reflected on, the fact that some parties will not believe that this is enough, and it should not be a particularly great surprise to anybody in the chamber that uh, I did not believe that all of the powers that could, should have been delivered were delivered. And of course, as um, my colleagues have pointed out in, in interventions, uh, that point has also been made, not just by the Scottish National Party, but by a whole host of different organisations, whether it's the Scottish Trade Union Congress, uh, or the uh, Engender Alliance, or the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations, or a whole host of other organisations that have expressed that view. There were, of course, three issues that I've raised in the Government's amendment, which are substantively different to the proposition the Conservatives put forward, and they are material and serious points that Parliament needs to reflect on. The first is that our amendment calls on both governments to produce draft clauses for the recommendations jointly to maintain this agreement. I cannot for the life of me I understand why that has not been taken forward. It is a proposition that we have put to the Prime Minister in a letter from the First Minister. It would seem to me as we translate the Smith recommendations, which Smith himself has said, Lord Smith has said in his own report, will have to be uh, translated into practical detail as a consequence of the headline commitments that have been uh, put into the agreement, uh, that that, in fact, should be done in a spirit of openness and transparency. It would also, in, you know, in the spirit of efficiency, be a much more effective way to take forward that point. What on earth is objectionable about that particular proposition? Secondly, um, and I would hope I might have some common ground here, that's why I made the intervention on Ruth Davidson, our amendment looks for early action from both governments on implementation where possible and especially to allow the Parliament to extend the vote to 16 and 17 year olds for the 2016 Scottish election. Now, Ruth Davidson has accepted that there is an argument, indeed she's committed to it, that we should take steps outside a substantive piece of UK legislation to legislate to enable 16- and 17-year-olds to vote in the 2016 election. If we wait for the substantive UK legislation on the subject, that cannot happen. So if we want it to happen, which I know everybody in the chamber wants to be the case, then we have to have early action to enable that to happen. There is unanimity in this parliament about that point. And it seems to me, from what the Secretary of State for Scotland said to the uh, devolution for the Powers Committee last Thursday, that the United Kingdom Government sees the argument for that point. What I can't for the life of me understand is why there isn't a reciprocal commitment to get on with legislating or taking forward actions that don't have to wait for UK, mm. substantive UK legislation. Um, for example, the devolution of air passenger duty was an issue that was um, recommended for devolution by the Kalman Commission back in 2010. And there is a mechanism in the Scotland Act 2012 that could devolve that power to the Scottish Parliament without substantive legislation in the United Kingdom Parliament. I cannot for the life of me understand why that opportunity isn't being seized to take this agenda forward and to devolve these responsibilities as quickly as possible. Indeed, in this respect, I was heartened by the comments that were made in a letter um, just uh, yesterday from Margaret Curran, the Shadow Secretary of State for Scotland, in which, in which uh, Margaret Curran has written to the Secretary of State for Scotland, pledging a variety of areas where the Labour Party is willing to cooperate in, the, um, in advancing this legislation. But where Margaret Curran says, I, and I quote, I would also like to meet with you before Christmas 
to discuss what other proposals made by the Smith Commission, because she's been previously talking about 16 and 17 year olds, may not require primary legislation and what powers we could seek to devolve through Section 30 orders. Now that appears to me to be a point where the Labour Party quite generously in this process has said, let's get on with it. Let's get on with taking the steps. Why wait for the comprehensive piece of legislation? I, Ruth Davidson concluded her speech with the great clarion call. Let's get on with it. Well, I want to get on with it, but I just don't understand. Ah, maybe Mr Brown is going to explain why the Conservatives are not prepared to get on with it. Gavin now, Brown. Let's just assume for a moment, presiding officer, that APD were devolved tomorrow. What would he do with it? John Swinney. Well, well we, we, can, we, can, we can always set out our... Well, 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 let me, well, let me, well, let, well, 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 OK. Let's go back to the White Paper. What the White Paper said is we would half APD with a view to... With a, half out over time before 2020 and then move to, uh, to abolish it. But well, that's taken it in stages. But what I'm, what I'm saying is let's get... Well, what Ruth Davidson is saying is let's do one thing. Let's devolve the power for 16 and 17 year olds and let's do nothing else. Yeah. Let's do nothing else. Stall. Because then let's look at other provisions like the work programme. We all sat in the Smith Commission and we signed up to words in this document which say we will devolve the work programme at the end of the current contract. And while we're doing that, we find out that the UK government is negotiating with the work programme contractors to extend the contract, to extend it. Oh, and Mr Johnson says it's still the same contract. That's but the problem. Mr. But Mr Johnson, is, Mr Johnson will understand why I'm just a little bit uneasy about the degree to which this represents good faith and that we sat in the Smith Commission and I signed up to, and I'm not seeking to escape from it, I signed up to a commitment to devolve the work programme at the end of the current contract and we now find the contract is being extended. And that's, so that's happening at a time where there appears to be no, there appears to be no willingness, uh, I'll give away a second, Mr Robertson, there appears to be no willingness to extend the early devolution of responsibilities beyond the issue of 16 and 17 year olds, on which we are delighted to cooperate with the United Kingdom Government. And I'll give way to Mr Robertson. Dennis Robertson. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary. Is the Cabinet Secretary not as disappointed as I am to hear that Ian Duncan Smith has already said he is not prepared to change his mind with regard to the work programme? John Smith. That, 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 that is a, 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 a point to be regretted, but what has given me hope is the fact that the Secretary of State for Scotland, in his meeting with the First Minister last Thursday, made it clear that he would make representations within the United Kingdom Government to determine if there was something different could be done to change Mr Duncan Smith's mind, which I do hope is successful. Now, the third difference between the Government's amendment and the Conservative motion is the last part, where we welcome the contribution of stakehold stakeholders and the public uh, to the work of the Commission and recognises the need for continuing meaningful public consultation and engagement to ensure the credibility of the process in, Scot in, in Scotland. And why is that important? Well, that's important for the very simple reason that the... Uh, and I went through this in my response, I think, to Ms Goldie in, the, uh, in my response to the statement last week. There are a whole host of organisations who have, in good faith, made their submissions to the Smith Commission about what they would like to see devolved. They've not uh, had those wishes fulfilled by what the Smith Commission has concluded. And I think it's now important that we engage constructively and actively with the stakeholder community in Scotland to ensure that we properly reflect their concerns and their aspirations as we take forward this legislation. So, I, um, I, I, so those are the reasons why the government has taken the stance that we've taken today. But there's one other point that I want to, to make in, in the chamber today, and we've covered some of this already. The Conservatives want to move the debate quite understandably on to what would we do with these powers. And of course, I, I, I'm very happy to debate and discuss what we would do with these uh, powers. But there is a stage before we get to that, and that is the implementation of these powers. The actual translation of all of this agreement into legislative form. And I think it would be a sign of good faith if the United Kingdom government was prepared to engage constructively about early implementation of these provisions. Because to say to people, 
in the referendum, as was said to them, look, you can vote no and you'll get change quicker than you'll get Scottish independence. And everybody was, I'm afraid I'll have, to, unless I... If you want. Yes, yes. I'll happily give way to this judge. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise the irony in having first uh, told the world that the government would not stick to the timescales, the schedule that had been put in place, now that it becomes obvious that that schedule will be stuck to, to start complaining about things not being brought forward against that schedule? Mr Swinney. The point I was coming on to make, Mr Johnson, is the fact that in the referendum people were told if they voted no, they would get more powers and they would get those powers quicker yep. than they would get Scottish independence. Now, everybody was pretty broadly agreed that if Scotland had voted yes, Scotland was heading for independence in March 2016. So, well, I think it was a, it was a, pretty, it was a pretty commonly accepted view. I seem to, well, I seem to, I seem, I'll, Mr McDonald will have to forgive me. I'll give away my Members in his last minute. It was such a seminal comment that Gordon Brown came along and said, you won't have to wait until March 2016. We'll deliver these powers even earlier. And what we're now finding yeah. is that the United Kingdom government and certainly the Conservative Party, although I hope to hear from the Labour Party, a reaffirmation of what Margaret Curran has said in her letter to the Secretary of State for Scotland, we should be getting on with the job of implementing these powers as soon as we'll we possibly can do. Speeches. And that is what the Scottish Government will press the UK Government exactly to deliver. I move the amendment. Many thanks. I now call on Tavish Scott to speak to and move Amendment 11830.1. Mr Scott, you have six minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would actually like us to move on from endlessly discussing process to the things that don't have to wait, as Mr Swinney very, very rightly uh, said, uh, because there are many things that could be done, and that's what my amendment looks at uh, this afternoon, because over the past seven years, uh, the Government in Edinburgh has stripped powers away from local authorities and communities. This Government has ruthlessly centralised decisions to create the trappings of power and state here in Edinburgh. Each and every part of Scotland has lost out because of that. The judgments of local people have been overridden by an ever mightier central government. And from the Northern Isles to the Highlands and right down to the borders, communities across Scotland have been stripped of the control of the local services they need. Local councils have had their funding and their taxes determined not by the town halls of this country, but by the Scottish government. So instead of that, we want something rather different. Uh, around 60 frontline police stations across Scotland have closed their doors to the public under the government. government. New police tactics are being imposed on local communities by the centralised National Police Scotland. Armed police were routinely patrolling even the smallest villages and towns. Courts of justice have been closed across Scotland on the say-so of a handful of MSPs sitting in this parliament. Decisions on major improvements on to hospitals and health services have been taken out of the hands of local health boards and centralised here in Edinburgh. Colleges have been forced to merge and cut their local ties. A single fire board, a single fire board now runs the whole country, losing local knowledge in that process. Scottish Enterprise has been reorganised by the SNP so that decisions are taken now at its national headquarters in Glasgow rather than used to happen across Scotland. The Crofting Commission may be amalgamated with Scottish Natural Heritage and the Forestry Commission for Scotland. Liberal Democrats want a different approach to the one we have here in Scotland about devolution within Scotland. We believe that local people can be trusted with more powers, not less, to shape their local areas. And local people are best placed to make decisions about the services which affect them, rather than all these decisions being taken in Edinburgh. The SNP promised time and time again, as they centralised, that services would be flexible and responsive to local needs. People know that has not been the case. But now our calls for local dev devolution are not alone. As Lord Smith re reflected, there is a strong desire to see the principle of de devolution extended further with the transfer of powers from Holyrood to local communities. Now, the Cabinet Secretary... Yeah. I, I thank the member for giving way. We, we do distinguish between local communities and local authorities, and that in some cases uh, you know, it needs to go below the city council or the council level. 
But I think uh, Mr Mason makes a perfectly fair observation on that. Uh, and in an area such as his, I suspect there would be a different perspective than that of mine, uh, given the size of the local authority that uh, he uh, uh, no doubt uh, deals with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, today, but also in the previous uh, discussions and statements we have had on uh, the Smith Agreement, has cited Civic Scotland. Well, let me cite a few of Civic Scotland's observations as well. The Scottish Borders Council told the Smith Commission in their submission that there is a pressing need for the decentralisation of powers from the Scottish Parliament to local authorities. The Scottish Association for Public Transport noted that the basis of devolution is that decisions about Scotland are best taken close to the people they affect and with their participation and consent. SV, SCVO said the Scottish political parties should commit to decentralising new and existing devolved powers even further to people and communities wherever possible. And the Institute, can I just finish these couple of quotes? And certainly happy to give away. The Institute of Chartered Accountants for Scotland, I'm sure an organisation Mr Crawford gives high regard to, believe in the spirit of devolution, consideration should be given as to whether the Scottish Parliament should cascade appropriate powers and responsibility down to local authorities. And this is a, a great advocate of local authorities. I'm sure Mr Crawford would agree with that. I'm listening very Mr. carefully. I'm listening very carefully to the points Tavish Scott's making. And most of it is about process that he criticised John Swinney that we were talking about. So could, I wonder if Tavish Scott could tell us, from our existing powers, what some specific examples of ideas that the Liberal, Liberal Democrats have for transfer of powers to local government? Tavis Scott. Never have centralised the police force, and I'd make sure the councillors on my part of Scotland were looking after police again in the way in which you took them away from them. So if you want one example alone, I'd, I'd end the, the, what you did with the National Police Force, because that's a terrible decision, and a government in the future will reverse that. The Electoral Reform Society Scotland believes that citizens should be able to shape the decisions that affect their lives, that our institutions should reflect the people they serve. Now, I've heard much about listening to the case uh, made by Civic Scotland and by all these kind of organisations to the Smith Commission. It strikes me the government should heed that. And on the Crown State, it is not enough that this Parliament has control. As my amendment makes clear, the responsibility for the management of the Crown Estate's economic assets and the revenue generated must be devolved to a local authority, uh, areas such as Shetland and Orkney, as the Smith Commission and agreement actually says. And I hope the SNP will not block that and rather make that happen as the agreement actually says. Can I finish, presiding officer, by touching on the Scottish Government's uh, financial scrutiny, or rather the scrutiny of it, this is a highly centralised state, and I have argued before for a tartan office of budget responsibility for that reason. The UK Government got it right. It divorced economic and financial forecasting, which can be manipulated by politicians from central government. It established the OBR. Now, that OBR is no uh, friend of any UK Chancellor, and it's not meant to be. The OBR provides an independent assessment of the nation's books, but not just for the government, but for all representatives, policymakers, uh, indeed for every uh, person in this Could chamber. You close, no such emphatic independent assessment is made of the Scottish Government's financial performance. The Fiscal Commission is not independent. It should and it must be. So if Mr Swinney wants early action, as he called for in his remarks to, to Parliament just this afternoon, how about starting with the Fiscal Commission? Thanks. And I now call on Drew Smith. Six minutes, Mr Smith, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. The Smith Agreement comes at the culmination of an unprecedented level of debate about how our country is run and it fulfils our promise on both the substance and the timetable for further devolution of power to this Scottish Parliament. The referendum three months ago settled the question of Scotland's place in the United Kingdom. The people of Scotland instructed all of us to make devolution work, a stronger Scottish Parliament and a stronger partnership across the United Kingdom. That is what members on this side campaigned for, and we believe that Lord Smith and the party nominees on his commission should indeed be congratulated for delivering this extensive package of powers, and we will therefore do support the motion before us today. In addition to spending powers over health, housing, education, justice, enterprise, and many others, this Parliament now stands ready to take much greater responsibility for taxation, linking more effectively the money that government has to spend with the performance of our economy. On welfare, it means that decisions on how best to help support our people get into work will be taken by those with the greatest understanding of the real labour market in every part of Scotland. Training for work should reflect the jobs that can be created, just as efforts to boost jobs should reflect our most vital asset, the skills 
of our people. We can also join up policy in health, housing and work with extensive powers over disability and other welfare benefits. For the first time, the Scottish Government will have the power to create new benefits or to make top-up payments. And with more flex flexible taxation powers, the choice over whether to do so and how to fund it will now be a real one. No longer will it be good enough for Scottish Ministers to simply complain about the decisions of others without being willing to take action themselves. This is a strong and ambitious extension of the Parliament's powers. Bruce Crawford. In particular, on welfare issues, that it would be wrong if the proposals that are contained in the Smith Commission's report were actually to end up in a situation where, if the Scottish Government were to choose to top up, that, that universal credit would in turn be reduced. Um, I, I think actually the, the, the Secretary of State made that point at, at committee him, himself in response to your, your own questions, where Bruce Crawford is concerned about that, but I hope it, I hope it can be uh, taken forward in the discussions um, the Secretary of State indicated would take place. Um, this is a strong and ambitious extension of the Parliament's powers. And, President Officer, that is why we signed it. And that's why the next Labour government is committed to implementing it in a new Scotland Act in our first Queen's speech. Or, as the Deputy First Minister said, even quicker than that on the issues that don't require uh, legislation, as Margaret Curran indicated, we're very happy to have that conversation, certainly. I'm grateful to Mr Smith for giving way. He mentioned at the outset of his remarks that uh, he was supportive of the motion. I wonder if he's supportive of the amendment, because the amendment makes exactly that point that he, he's raised. Drew Smith. Um, uh, uh, the, the Deputy First Minister described Margaret Curran's uh, remarks on this as generous. Um, yesterday, in her re remarks, stand. I'll come to deal with the government's amendment shortly. Our modern Scottish Parliament is firmly entrenched in our national life, and it's right that its maturity should now be recognised with control over its uh, own elections. But during uh, the progress of new legislation, we do believe that it is right that, just as with the previous Scotland Bill, the Scotland, Scottish Parliament should work in partnership with the UK Parliament, and we believe that the same process that was used then should should be applied now. It is a simple fact, uh, Deputy First Minister, that the, 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 the in legislation in the UK Parliament will be introduced by the UK Government. and We all expect them to work in the spirit of the agreement, but I, I have to say to the Scottish Government, let us not seek an unnecessary grievance on an issue of process before the ink is even dry. Those who held the minority view in September are entitled to continue making their case for Scotland leaving the UK. But in doing so, they need to accept that strengthened and effective devolution is the position which most Scots support and around which even more Scots can unite. When the full scope of the Smith Agreement is implemented, our Parliament will be one of the most powerful devolved legislatures anywhere in the world. Labour likes that. We will always defend this Parliament, which we were proud to bring into being and to make the case for even greater devolution beyond Edinburgh to every community in Scotland. We will make the case for reforming the way our whole UK is governed, with a constitutional convention for all of Britain, devolution for every part of the UK uh, that wants it, and abolition of the House of Lords to be replaced with an elected Senate. Constitutional change may not be what motivates the Labour Party, but both our record and our ambition make clear our commitment. Powers should be exercised in the interests of people and at the level where the people's voice is most easily heard. Pulling and sharing risk and resource, yes, where it is in Scotland's interest to work with our closest neighbours. Taking responsibility for ourselves where we can make a difference and devolving power away from the centre so that local government becomes more than just local administration. Presiding officer, the parties have come together to make the Smith Agreement, but we will all put our own case as to how powers should be exercised. We would use the new, new powers to ensure that those with most pay a fair rate of tax. That is why we support the reinstatement of a 50p tax rate. We would reform the work programme so that it responds to the real needs of the regional economies uh, within Scotland. And having placed the issue of double devolution at the heart of the debate, we will stand by our commitment not just to Scotland's cities, but also to Scotland's islands, and we therefore support the amendment in Tavish Scott's name too. It is worth remembering, though, the drivers behind the Smith process. Throughout and before the referendum, Scottish Labour argued that our alternative to a separate Scotland was a stronger Scotland. And that position was continually attacked by those who have always looked for faults in the devolution and denied its strengths. That is why we made a promise to come together with others, to discuss our ideas with a timetable set out in advance. We knew that we would have to compromise, and we have. We knew that it would be a challenge to meet the, the timetable, but we have at all times proceeded with good faith. In 1997, Labour promised a Scottish Parliament and had it set up 
by 99. We initiated the Calman process and already devolution has been strengthened. In 2014, we published our powers for a purpose and we vowed to work with others to deliver a powerhouse parliament. When Lord Smith was appointed to his those, commission, please. a promise had been made. When we signed the Smith Agreement, it became a promise kept. Presiding officer, 2014 has been a momentous year for Scotland. 2014 is the year Scotland rejected independence and endorsed partnership. It is the year the parties have agreed on further powers. To 2016 and beyond, the challenge is not constitutional, it becomes political. And the greatest test of political will, presiding officer, is not collecting tools for your toolbox, it is the good to which you put the, to the tools that you have to work. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate. Uh, we're very tight for time today. Five minute speeches, please. Call on Lindiana, Linda Fabiani first, and Lewis MacDonald will follow thereafter. <laughs> Five minutes, please. I've been called many a name in my day, presiding officer, but that's a completely new one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, one of the things I, I'd like to, to start off by doing is uh, looking at, at some of the myths um, that surround the Smith Commission. I don't mean the myth that the vow was delivered or the myth that extensive powers have, are likely to come or that it will be home rule or as near federalism as possible. I mean some of the other myths that are doing the rounds. The first one is that this potential transfer of powers will make this one of the most powerful non-sovereign parliaments in the world. I don't buy that at all. Whilst people are shaking around spice briefings and quoting from them, perhaps they should look at the footnotes as well as the charts. For example, some countries such as Canada and Spain have differing levels of decentralisation to subcentral governments and they are not reflected in the chart. So, regional differences uh, in places like Spain and Canada weren't always taken into account. And for example, the Basque Country um, where they raise all taxes and pay Madrid as the centre for their services. That seems to me to be a much more powerful position than depending on a grant for most of our income. The second myth is that powers are already here. Um, there seems to be this assumption that the Scottish Parliament now has all these powers. I've heard it out there, I've even heard it in here. We don't. Um, we hope that they will all come. Uh, I notice that Drew Smith um, said it's a fact that they will come. Um, he may have total faith in his own party should they win the UK general election. It's uh, very touching to see that he has faith in the Conservative Party and the Lib Dems and UKIP. So the powers are not already here, but let's hope they do wend their way here through the Westminster process. The third myth is that the SNP agreed with everything that was in the Smith Commission, that this was the best for Scotland. Negotiations were entered into in good faith by all concerned. It does not mean that the premise that was agreed is agreed as necessarily the best for Scotland, but it's a product of negotiation, discussion and agreement. And politics is, after all, as many have said, the art of the possible. Certainly, Mr Kelly. I thank Linda Fabiani for taking the intervention. Can you just confirm that the SNP did sign the final agreement? <laughs> Linda Fabiani. Well, you know what? Order. I was about to say that those who espouse that view are either naive, disingenuous or a bit daft. Folk can make their own minds up about that. But the reality, reality is that we're at, we're at where we're at. And we do welcome the new powers as we support all progress for Scotland. But we are disappointed at the lack of cohesion. For example, um, the work programme to help people into jobs, but not job-creating powers. Some benefits to assist disabled people, but not the power to halt the... Uh, no, thank you. To halt the absolutely shameful work capability assessments, which cause such stress to many people with disabilities. So yes, additional powers are welcome, but I don't believe that control over less than 30% of Scotland's tax take and less than 20% of welfare is extensive. I believe that's disappointing. The Scottish Government in the shape of John Swinney and the SNP in the shape of myself entered into negotiations in good faith. The ongoing discussions will, I hope, take place in good faith by all concerned. 
I do have some worries about that, though, um, following last week's appearance to the Devolution Committee by the Secretary of State for Scotland. Um, we talked about the, the work programme, um, and I said, um, pointed out, I don't think MD here will disagree, um, and certainly Civic Scotland uh, agreed in all their submissions, that the work programme isn't working particularly well for Scotland, and with control we could use it much more effectively. I believe we ought to our client group to do that. I was then told by the Secretary of State that they have already done an extension to the commercial providers of the work programme up until draw to a close, please? 2017. I believe that's not in good faith. I've since heard that they're now negotiating to take it up to 2019. I think that's really disappointing. I don't believe it's in good faith. I would ask for some clarification uh, from the Conservatives uh, as to what's happening there, and indeed from the Liberal, the Liberal Democrats, because the Secretary of State for Scotland is a Liberal Democrat. So let's look at getting early um, responses to some of these issues. I would say the work programme is one of the most important of all. Thank you, President. Many thanks. I now call on Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Five minutes. Thank you very much. The Smith Agreement does indeed mark another significant stage in the progress of Scotland's devolved parliament. For Scottish Labour, the enactment of this agreement will be another historic step on the road to a political settlement fit for purpose in a modern social democratic Scotland. It was another Smith, John Smith, who said that devolution was the settled will of the Scottish people. He could not know how that will would be tested 20 years after his death, but he would have been pleased that Scotland emerged from that test with devolution strengthened, not with devolution cast aside. Just as famously, Donald Dewar said that devolution was a process, not an event. He could not know how that process would go forward, but he did know that the Scottish Constitutional Convention marked the beginning of a debate rather than the last word in an argument. His vision that brought us to this place was not of fixed powers or settled institutions, but a vision of a dynamic process of change that would change again as it evolved, matured and developed. Nor was it just about Scottish devolution. It was also about a reinvented United Kingdom with a devolved Scotland at its heart. It is that reinvention of the Union that the Smith Agreement helps to advance, as well as the powers and responsibilities of the Scottish Parliament. Not all the signatories to the Smith Agreement, of course, are committed to a stronger union, any more than they were when they joined the campaign in support of the original Scotland Act in 1997. But John Swinney was explicit in his evidence to the Devolution Committee last week that signing the Smith Agreement committed him to endorse its contents and work in good faith to implement them. And that is a commitment that all members of all signatory parties should now seek to deliver. But for those of us who support the devolution agenda in its own right, this next step is not just about additional powers for a devolved parliament, important though that is, it is about reaching a new balance among the member countries of this United Kingdom. And if Don John Smith and Donald Dewar made the case a generation ago for devolution to strengthen the union, it is important to restate that case today. Rebalancing the union means reforming Westminster, of course. The Union Parliament must be fit for purpose in the 21st century, and a future UK Constitutional Convention must have that topic high on its agenda. But when some in Ruth Davidson's party propose that Westminster should be something other than the Union Parliament, they are in danger of undermining the Union itself, however inadvertently. William Hague led a House of Commons debate in October on devolution following the Scottish referendum, which turned out to be about English votes for English laws at Westminster and not about devolution of legislation for England from Westminster. When Mr Hague was challenged about where he might find cross-party support for those proposals, the one example he offered was that of the SNP, uh, which is telling in itself. In my view, if the United Kingdom is to evolve in future as a union of equal partners, then Westminster cannot be both the English Parliament and the Union Parliament at the same time. Instead, certainly. 
John Mason. I mean, the member will know that our members do not take part in a vote if, uh, it's, say, on health or something like that. Does he not think it's morally wrong that Scottish Labour MPs take part in such Louis votes? Louis MacDonald. No, no, I don't. And John Mason comes to my aid as a witness to prove that indeed English votes for English laws is not a proposition that's compatible with a strong uh, United Kingdom going forward. A modern union parliament should reflect all parts of the union, both through a House of Commons directly elected by all UK citizens on an equal basis, and through a second chamber representing the nations and regions of the UK. Devolution to cities and regions within England will be important there, just as double devolution to Scotland's cities, regions and islands will be important here. But the devolution of power in England must be devolution from Westminster, just as, is, as it has been in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland since 1997. And devolution in England, once started, will no doubt evolve further, as it has done in the other countries of the United Kingdom. Now, those issues will be resolved elsewhere, but they do set the context for the Scotland Bill, which will come to this Parliament to consider in the course of the next 12 months or so. Responsibility for bringing forward that legislation lies clearly with the Government of the United Kingdom and specifically with the Scotland Office, as Alistair Carmichael told the Devolution Committee last week. It is not for Mr Swinney to invite himself to join in drafting UK legislation, but that legislation does have to deliver on the Smith Agreement, and in doing so, I hope it will attract the support of all parties. But I hope it will also deliver on the vision of John Smith and Donald Dewar and on the vote of the Scottish people in September by strengthening both the Scottish Parliament and Very the United briefly. Kingdom. I'm grateful to Mr Macdonald. One of the points that we discussed in the committee last Thursday was the issue about, uh, it relates to translating Smith into practical reality. And one of the points was about the extension of the scope of responsibilities in the Crown Estate to 200 miles. Does Mr Macdonald believe that to be in here in the Smith Commission. Louis McJohnson, you must come to a close, please. I think, I think the discussions that we had at the Devolution Committee last week point the way forward to how we can work together across different parliaments and with local government as well on the devolution of the Crown Estates, among other things. But the proposition that governments should work together to advise the process is a very different thing from governments should work together on the process. And I think Mr Swinney should recognise that the opportunity we all have is when that bill comes here, the Scotland bill comes here next year, and all members of this parliament uh, will be offered the opportunity then uh, to say whether that bill is fit for purpose going forward. Many thanks. Mark Macdonald to be followed by Marjo Fraser. While there are certainly positive elements in these proposals, we are underwhelmed by the package as a whole, which does not meet our aspirations. Uh, Graham Smith, General Secretary of the STUC. Uh, other equalities organisations also called for equality law to be devolved, and we are disappointed that only one small transfer of powers is recommended to enable gender quotas on the boards of public bodies in Gender Scotland. Uh, we have said all along that anything less than wholesale devolution of welfare would be a real missed opportunity to meet the needs of the most vulnerable people in our communities, so we are disappointed to see that today's offerings fall far short of this. John Downey, SCVO. Uh, does this really allow Scotland to design its own economic and social policies and to diverge significantly from what is happening in England? Not very much. Professor Michael Keating. The recommendations of the Smith Commission do not go as far as we and many other civic organisations had called for in our submissions. Mary Taylor, CEO of the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. We are disappointed that the Smith Commission failed to devolve all welfare and more fiscal powers to Scotland. We consulted with hundreds of disabled people and their near unanimous view was that we need a Devo Max, including the devolution of all welfare benefits. Bill Scott of Inclusion Scotland. I think that in the longer term, everybody involved may come to regret putting all the eggs in the income tax basket rather than looking at a spread of taxes. Lord Jack McConnell, former First Minister. And what we have there, presiding officer, to negate this view that is being put out, that somehow the disappointment in the uh, conclusions of the Smith Commission is confined to this party or these benches, is a range of quotes from organisations most of whom, uh, other than Lord McConnell, who was an active campaigner for a no vote, took an avowedly neutral stance in the referendum, but nonetheless put across extremely strong views of what they, while well, Tavish Scott scoffs at the notion of Civic Scotland taking neutral stances during the referendum, very disappointed to see him besmirch, no thank you, but see him besmirch, no, he, Tavish, I have only, I, I have only five please. minutes and Tavish Scott has the opportunity to sum up for his amendment, he can deal with it in his summing up. 
that, that these Torture. organisations did indeed uh, look for strong powers in the Smith Commission, which they did not find within it. We've looked at the issue around early transfer of powers, and it was explored uh, at the Devolution and Further Powers Committee. One second, Mr Smith. It was explored in the Devolution and Further Powers Committee's um, discussions and deliberations. Um, there is an opportunity to disaggregate some of the powers, and Scotland's airports themselves, in terms of air passenger duty, have called for it to come as soon as possible. I welcome the view that, that appears to come from the Labour Party that this is something that could be taken forward, and I think that that is something we could work constructively on. I'll take Mr Smith's Joe Smith. Hey, thanks very much, and I, I hope very much that we, that, we, that we can. I just wondered whether Mr Macdonald, in, in listing the views of Civic Scotland, would go on to quote any of their views around what the Scottish Government describes as job-creating powers, and most, if not all, of those organisations describe as dangerous tax competition. Well, it, it's interesting, because Mr Smith appears to suggest that you should only listen to people when they uh, say that you shouldn't devolve something to this Parliament. I take the very... I take the very... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back. Well, let me... Well, no, no, let, let me explain, let oh, me explain that further. Let me explain that further, because we are receiving powers around welfare and taxation to this Parliament. The question is one around coherence and whether there is a coherence to those powers and how they could be applied in Scotland. Now, Mr Smith uh, suggests that there is a difference between us around our views on devolution. I would suggest the difference between us is, is not that I am ignorant to the strengths of devolution. I suggest the difference between us is that he is ignorant to the limitations of devolution and has consistently been so because time after time in this chamber, we hear the Labour Party putting the onus on the Scottish Government to react to bad decisions that are made elsewhere and to use the devolved settlement to address those. Now, some of that, some of the powers around welfare will come to this chamber, but at the same time, there will be powers around welfare that will main, remain reserved. And Mr Crawford at the committee highlighted, and it's interesting, again, uh, much like members' differential views around uh, the uh, quality of submission from Civic Scotland, they have a differential view when it comes to listening to what SPICE have to say, because SPICE themselves have said that there is the uh, potential for top-ups to reserve benefits or uh, other decisions taken through devolved benefits to have an impact on the, in the receipt of universal credit, which goes against the, the, outline, uh, the, the points outlined in paragraph 55 of the Smith Commission report. And it is very important, therefore, when we're talking about the ability, for example, to create new benefits or to fund top-ups, and Drew Smith said that we will have the powers to be able to fund those, we have only a limited number of taxpayers that are going to be made available to this Parliament, and I accept that will require decisions to be taken, and I'm sure Drew Smith will bring forward proposals of his own where he sees top-ups being required or new benefits being created of how those would be funded within a settlement where essentially income tax really is the only lever that you could use to generate that significant funding, unless you were to have uh, the, the assignment of revenue from VAT to see significant increases, but I think we would all agree that that's not going to happen straight away, Mr. especially Smith, when we don't have those job-creating powers. And I would say that Gavin Brown's intervention on Mr Swinney, I think, sums up rather neatly the whole problem in this process when he said, you, if you want the power, what do you want to do with it? The point about this is... Well, no. Audit, please. Well, we must hear well, the no, member conclude. It's very, it, it's very simple, because the principle is not about what an individual political party would do with the power. The principle is around whether or not the power should rest in the hands of the Parliament of Scotland. Because if we're all we're going to do is say you can't have this power because you won't use it the way we want to do, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. I'm afraid I must now ask members to keep to their five minutes. We have run out of the little time that we had. Murdo Fraser to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Uh, thank you. Presiding officer, there's one thing that is absolutely in no doubt in this debate, and that is that the Smith Commission has more than delivered on the vow signed by the three UK party leaders. And for the avoidance of doubt, let us just remind ourselves what it said. It stated that, and I quote directly, the Scottish Parliament is permanent and extensive new powers for the Parliament will be delivered by the process and to the timetable agreed and announced by our three parties starting on 19 September. And those on the SNP benches should note there was no mention of Devomax, no mention of Home Rule and no mention of federalism. And on any measure, the Smith Commission proposals do represent extensive new powers yeah, yeah. over taxation, over welfare, over elections, over the Crown Estate, over transport, over consumer protection, over employment programmes, over fuel poverty programmes, over rights to fracking and much, much more. And just so we are clear, no, let me make some progress. And just so we are clear, the additional tax powers will mean 
that the Scottish Parliament will raise as a percentage of total tax revenue more than sub-national governments in Greece, Portugal, Ireland, France, Italy, Norway, Austria, Belgium, the Netherlands, Finland, Iceland, Denmark, Sweden and Spain. I will also raise more than states in federal countries such as the US, Germany and Australia. That is an extensive set of powers. I'll give way to Mr. Reedy. Well, not, thank, you, thank the member for giving way, but does he not accept that this Parliament, even after the Smith Commission proposals have been enacted, will only be responsible for 40% of its revenue base? In what way is that extensive? Major Fraser. Find, I think you'll find from Spice the figure is more than 50%. But this puts us, this puts us near the top of every devolved sub-national government in the Western world. So, let us be in no doubt, when the SNP decry the powers in the Smith Commission and claim that they are not extensive, they are simply misrepresenting the position and trying to con the public into thinking that what is proposed is insignificant. But if there's one thing we could have predicted with 100% accuracy before the Smith Commission published its proposals is that the SNP would say they were not enough. And true to form, that is exactly what they are now saying, ignoring the international evidence about how extensive they are in relation to other countries. Now, of course, I understand, no, I need to make some progress. I understand the SNP wanted independence, mm -hmm. but that is precisely what the Scottish people rejected yeah, not yeah. three months ago and by a comprehensive margin. And short of that, the SNP now say they want Devo Max, as they define it, essentially independence by another name, which does not exist along the lines they propose in a single federal country anywhere in the world. But, presiding officer, we need to move on from talking about what powers the Scottish Parliament might have to discussing what we're actually going to do with the powers yeah, yeah. that we currently have and those that are about to be devolved to build the stronger Scotland we all want to see. Last week, I raised in this chamber the question of air passenger duty. For years, we've had to listen to SNP speakers in this chamber, in committee and on public platforms demanding the devolution of air passenger duty and decrying its negative impact on Scottish tourism. Well, now it's time for the SNP to tell us what they want to do with this tax now being devolved. In the White Paper, we were told that in the event of a yes vote, then within the next parliamentary session, APD would be cut by 50%. That could have been any point in the next six years. And, of course, people voted no. So what is now to happen to APD? If it is as bad a tax as the SNP have claimed in the past, will they move quickly to cut it or eliminate it? And they need to tell us. And there was no clarity at all from Mr Swinney on this issue when he was questioned by Mr Brown earlier in the debate. Now, we've seen on lands and buildings transactions Members in this last minute. the Scottish Government come forward with its proposals, which were, were of course, gazumped by the Chancellor yes. last week. Many Scottish house buyers will be put at a competitive disadvantage come April unless the Scottish Government have a rethink. So let's hear what they're going to do about that. Yes. And we need to know what they propose for income tax. The First Minister has hinted there might be an increase in the top rate. That is a political choice she and our party are free to make. But they need to be careful. There are some 13,000 individuals in Scotland paying the top rate of tax. Very many of these will work cross-border, with a base in London or elsewhere, as well as in Scotland. It will not take much for them to relocate their tax residency elsewhere. And an increase in the top rate of tax might see a fall in the tax Take. Yep. But these are precisely the debates I'm looking forward to having in this chamber. Parties on all sides can set out their ideas on taxation and on welfare spending. Some will argue for higher taxes and some will argue for lower. And what the Smith Commission allows us to do is to have that properly rounded political debate we've been missing for the last 15 years. A finish. debate where politicians here are properly financially accountable for their decisions. Presiding officer, we need to move on from talking about the Constitution. People in Scotland had their say on September the 18th. Now it's time to make devolution work better and build a grown-up parliament for grown-up politicians. Thank you. I'm afraid I have to give fair warning that I will need to cut members' microphones off at five minutes. Roderick Campbell to be followed by James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. If I can begin briefly just to comment on the vow produced late in the day, imprecise, imprecisely defined, in my view, designed to be so imprecisely defined. But I think we should look at it in context. Gordon Brown on the 8th of September in Lonehead had called for a modern form of Scottish Home Rule within the United Kingdom, previously saying if Scotland had voted no, it would receive powers that would be as near to federalism as possible in a nation where one part forms 85% of the population. Mr Campbell, could you lift your microphone up, please? Is it on? 
Yeah, I hope thank so. you. Yeah. Whatever the vow was meant to mean, in no sense can Smith be construed as giving to Scotland the minimum which I believe the majority of Scotland now wants, uh, and is not, in my view, what any self-respecting federal state would look like. In Canada, and no disrespect to murder in his references to elsewhere, but in Canada, as Ian McGuerta points out in his new book, federal provinces are constitutionally able to tax anything they want to tax, except international and internal trade, setting their own rates. Clearly, to that extent, Smith is a disappointment. Uh, time is tight. When we look at Smith, it's easy to see its shortcomings on tax, not just on corporation tax and on oil and petroleum tax, but on taxes such as inheritance tax and capital gains tax which remain at Westminster. To that degree, it does not even meet the aspirations, not only of the STUC, but of the Liberal Democrats on tax. Indeed, James Mitchell, an independent commentator, has pointed out that although the Lib Dems maintained that Smith offers home rule and had long campaigned for home rule, it looks little like that proposed by two previous commissions. And let's look at what other organisations said in framing their submissions to Smith. On tax and national insurance, unison backed devolution of national insurance as the link with contributory benefits is becoming increasingly weak, they said. Government needs to see the full impact of their taxation policy on people's incomes. Only two taxes, APD and the aggregates levy, are devolved in full, and that was proposed in Calman. So maybe Smith is not quite as radical as has been suggested today. And as the Scottish Council of Voluntary Organisations pointed out in their submission to Smith, Having powers over a diverse range of taxes seems an appropriate and balanced approach too. On welfare, the Campbell Commission had said nothing, of course, but their time is tight. But the Campbell Commission has said nothing, of course, but Liberals finally embraced with other unionist parties proposals that give control of the very modest 15% of the welfare budget. My understanding, however, is that the weekend before Smith produced its report, at their Dunfermline conference, the Liberals did a U-turn on their previous position to a position of support, let me finish that point and I will give way, to a position of support for major welfare powers to be devolved, according to a report in the Scotland on Sunday, or uh, a major uh, transfer of welfare, or major welfare reform package, according to the Lib Dem website. I'll give away at that point. Tavish Scott. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Could he dredge anything out of his character which is good about the Smith Agreement? <laughs> Roger Campbell. No, it's, 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 obviously, it's, it's obviously a step forward. But just in relation to the point on welfare, the, the point remains that if you take, uh, take PIP out of the occasion, you're left with just 6% of the total Social Security budget having been transferred. And that, I would suggest, is very modest indeed. The National Carers Association argued in their submission to Smith that to avoid complexity for claimants and the cost of managing two systems, it would appear to make sense to devolve the full range of welfare powers. And for a moment, just a short moment in time, in that week before Smith reported, uh, the unionists seemed to be moving in that direction until it would appear that London Masters said no. The minimum wage, of course, remains reserved, and as the Child Poverty Action Group have, of course, pointed out, key levers for delivering poverty, not only the minimum wage, but child benefit and wider economic and fiscal powers, remain at Westminster. To echo the expert working group on welfare, powers should be considered in tandem with other fiscal powers, such as the ability to create a fair tax base, greater borrowing flexibility, and greater investment in job creation, which could then allow Scotland greater access to control the factors within the labour market and economy, such as employment, and Final that affect minute. and impact on welfare issues. On equalities, paragraph 60 of Smith says the Equality Act 2010 will remain reserved. And while rightly gender quotas are coming in this Parliament's way, as Mark MacDonald has indicated earlier on, much more could have been done in that field. And on immigration, a partial devolution of power might have enabled this Parliament to reintroduce a two-year post-study work visa called for not only by NUS Scotland, but by those august organisations, the Institute of Directors and the SCDI, amongst others. The SCDI's view was that uh, without that, the economy will be undermined by continuing problems in the attraction of necessary talent. Again, experience in federal Canada is instructive. Except in paragraph 96, there is reference to that as an additional issue which could be considered, but we need to turn that into a reality quickly. And we need to put in place the agreed recommendations at the earliest opportunity, not only in relation to 16 and 17 year olds, but generally. Presiding officer, I think I'm going to have to stop there. Many Fine. thanks. Yeah. James Kelly to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. There can be no doubt that compared with the original set of powers which were devolved to the Scottish Parliament when the Parliament was set up in 1999, what has now been set out in the Smith Agreement is a much more substantial step forward in terms of uh, tax, 
uh, and welfare, the opportunities that those set of powers uh, present for us to make a difference to the issues that we face in our communities throughout Scotland uh, gives us a, a, real, uh, a real opportunity. I think there are a number of implications that fall from the agreement. I think, first of all, uh, we all need to move on from the constitutional discussion. And I think one of the unfortunate things about this afternoon's debate, uh, quite surprisingly, I have to say, is that it's clear to me that the SNP haven't moved on. Um, I listened very, very carefully to Mr Swinney in his 10 minutes. Uh, he was a bit like a, a lecturer at a seminar. We had 10 minutes of process and we had nothing about the new powers and what the new powers could do to actually make a difference. What Mr Swinney and the, I will tell you, what Mr Swinney and the SNP need Order, to remember please. is that we are elected to this parliament as politicians to represent our constituents and to work on behalf of our constituents. And when we, when we get a, an opportunity with substantial enhanced powers, then it's incumbent on us to make those powers work and to make a difference. Uh, yeah, I will give way, Mr. John Mason. Mr. Kelly, for giving way. Would you accept that it is the Conservatives who, rather than choosing a subject we could actually debate that we do something, have chosen the Constitution because they are fixated with it? James Kelly. I think, I think what this debate does is it gives an opportunity to examine some of the issues that exist in Scotland and how we could use those powers uh, to make a difference. For example, uh, yesterday, there was a study published by the Public Health Observatory examining health inequalities uh, in Scotland. Uh, the, the, the average life expectancy of a male in Drumchapel is 73 years. Now, if you travel three miles to Bears Den, it's 10 years more. It's 83 years. Now, nobody in this chamber uh, you know, would find that acceptable. And what the study... Uh, demonstrated was that whereas uh, changes in health policy will have an impact on that, the biggest impact uh, would be on changes uh, in tax and also in welfare, things which are handed down uh, by the Smith Commission. Uh, no, I'm short of time. I mean, one of the aspects that the study concentrated on was that of the living wage something that the SNP benches have voted against five times to extend the living wage to public contracts. So as well as examining the powers coming down the line, you should examine the powers that you've got currently in order to make a difference to health inequalities. I think another issue that could be examined and developed is that of access to education. The SNP are always telling us uh, how we've got free education in Scotland. But the reality on the ground is that if you stay in Morningside, you have an 8 out of 10 chance of getting to university. But in the poorer areas of Glasgow, you only have a 1 in 10 chance. So that access to free education is very limited in some, some, of, our part, some of the parts uh, of our country. And we should be looking at these powers. I'm sorry, I'm into my the last minute, in his final minute. Uh, to take these issues uh, forward. In addition to that, uh, only yesterday we saw in the fuel poverty statistics published nearly a million households uh, now in fuel poverty. Again, that's something that's completely acceptable in today's Scotland. And again, I'm some, uh, something that I'm sure uh, 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 the people across the benches find totally un unacceptable. The Smith Agreement powers give us the opportunity um, to raise the top rate of tax of 50 pence and also to introduce new benefits which could help in addressing access to education, uh, looking at health and equality issues and also tackling the fuel poverty issues. I think that that's what the debate should be about. People in Scotland are looking for us to move on. They're looking for leadership from this chamber and it's incumbent on all of us, including the SNP government, to provide that leadership, to provide the ideas and to make a real difference now that the constitutional debate has been resolved. Thank you very much. Christine Graham to be followed by Jenny Mara. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I want to start with a quote from the forward by Lord Smith uh, to his report. 
Quote, Scotland voted no, but it did so with each of the three main UK parties, promising more powers for the Scottish Parliament. I was asked to lead a commission working with the five parties represented in the Scottish Parliament to agree what those new powers should be, and this is the important part for me. In doing so, I sought to give a voice to the public and the various organisations that make up the fabric of Scottish life. And for me, from the start, it has failed. The five political parties had to sign the contract. So, first of all, those signatures were on behalf of their political priorities. And in the case of the three unionist parties, probably what the Scottish branches were told they could sign up to by London HQ. How do I know this? Because, I quote again, at Tuesday's Cabinet, when Alistair Carmichael read out the plans taking shape at the Smith Commission table, one after another English Tory Cabinet ministers challenged the plans and their implications for their brief and their department. Theresa May was amongst them, George Osborne too. Duncan Smith was said to have been the sharpest critic of what was being, keywords, cooked up in Scotland fearing that his entire universal credit fabric was being unravelled. There weren't discussions with the Scottish people. There were discussions down telephone lines to London. I've only got five minutes. This de minimis offer cannot begin to meet the compromise of Devo Max, which, of course, was prohibited from being on the ballot paper from day one by the Unionist parties and only surfaced as an expeditious attempt to prevent independence. And even Murdo Fraser called it in this chamber the so-called vow. I notice he didn't do that today. Nick Clegg, however, prefers to call it vow max or vow plus plus. How far have the Liberals and federalism fallen? Now, it's not even coherent, a key word used by Mark MacDonald and also used by Smith in his submission. He asked for something to be substantial and coherent. Now, we can argue about whether it's substantial. This side and that side think it's substantial. We do not. But coherent, it definitely is not coherent. One cannot touch one part of the benefit system without the whole of the benefit system being available to you. You cannot touch one tiny part of income tax without having the whole of the tax system available. This is destabilising. And I can tell you something. Had the unionist parties been astute, which we know they're not, they might have shot the independence fox for good, or at least wounded it very seriously, had full tax and welfare powers been devolved to this parliament. But you've done completely way. the opposite. The Scottish people and 1.6 million voted for the full whack. 1.6 million is not a tiny minority. It's a substantial number of people. And a substantial number at the last minute voted for devolution, thinking they were going to get something big, not a pig in a poke. So you have not satisfied them. How do I know you have not satisfied them? Listen to me. Order, we have please. over 90,000 members in the Scottish National Party. I'll bet your membership's not going up. Why is it going up? Because people are disappointed at the way they've been treated by the Smith Commission. And by the way, my signature's Order. not on that paper. And it would never have been on that paper. What we learn is we know that this contract, this contract was done to the lowest common denominator so all signatures could be there. You thought the Smith Commission would Members bury independence dead. You thought it put the tin lid in it. It's done exactly the opposite. I thank you very much for that. Thank you, Jenny Mara. Order, please. Jenny Mara to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the speakers before me for their interesting and uh, important <laughs> contributions to this debate. Um, the Smith Commission, by virtue of it being signed in agreement by all the parties in this Parliament, delivers what I think the majority of Scots voted for on the 18th of September. It delivers that vow that was made to the people of Scotland, the vow for safer, faster and better change in Scotland. And I feel honoured to be speaking a about an agreement that upholds those pillars of agreement, compromise and consensus and ultimately, and I think this is ultimately important, respects the democratic will of the Scottish people. In addition to that, the Smith Agreement delivers us an exciting and vital 
reminder and something I'd like to focus on today, Presiding Officer. The reminder is around the decentralisation of our economy. Putting more faith and investment into our local authorities will allow us to shape and mould our economy in a way that encourages the fairer redistribution of wealth and the growth of wealth across Scotland and within each of our regions. And the Labour Party has argued for such decentralisation. The SNP has stated they would like to move towards a system of more local governance, but actions must now speak louder than words. The advantages to our economy which the Smith Agreement brings are multiple and in a large way all supplement this focus on decentralisation. The devolution of income tax, as we've already heard spoken about today, is one of these advantages. Powers over all rates and bans of income tax allow the Scottish Government to assess and restructure fairly, ensuring that those who pay into the public purse pay a fair amount. And public spending will more so be contingent now on the buoyancy of the Scottish economy, which should focus the attention of the Scottish Government more so on how it is managed. And when it comes to business, devolution of areas of competition policy gives Scottish ministers the power to carry out full second phase investigations on particular competition issues. Addressing such issues gives a more rigorous approach to creating and supporting sustainable business in Scotland and encourages a more organic development in our business sector. But surely, most significant to all in our economy are the new job-creating powers, which I believe the Smith Agreement brings. And this is where I take issue with what Linda Fabiani said this afternoon. Ms Fabiani said that we have the work programme, but we do not have job-creating powers. I would argue that we have struck the balance. We remain inside one of the strongest and most integrated economies in the world, but we have the borrowing powers of Calman with income tax and then the work programme. Now, these are the tools, but far, far more important, as I said to Mr Swinney in this chamber last week, and as every workman knows, is what you do with those tools, the design, the plan, the execution, and then the result. Labour's Yes, absolutely. Linda Fabiani. Yes, presiding officer, I can absolutely accept that, that Ms Mara would disagree with me. Um, but I wonder if she also disagrees with the STUC and many, many other um, submissions by Civic Scotland that have expressed disappointment at the lack of job-creating powers. Jenny Mara. I listen with interest to the list of people that Mark Macdonald read out this afternoon. And I would remind Ms Fabiani that the, the contented are always less outspoken. I think we discovered that during the referendum campaign. And for all the organisations, for all the organisations that Mark Macdonald quoted, there are many, 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 many organisations in Scotland that believe that the vow was delivered and exceeded and are happy with that. Final if I can, minute. If I can get back to what we you do with these tools, presiding officer, our plan is for a modern industrial economy, devolving the work plan to, to programme to local authorities, meeting local economic priorities, meeting the skills gap in IT and engineering and using our colleges as a powerhouse to drive that economy. Presiding officer, the Smith Agreement makes Scotland the most powerful devolved body of almost anywhere in the world. And it will be what the Scottish Government now does with these significant new tools that will show, that will be the real proof of their ambition for Scotland. Presiding officer, in my opinion, achievements over the last seven years of the SNP Government have been few. They only have 18 months left. I hope they get their tools and get working. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart McMillan, to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Uh, during the debate on the Smith Commission on the 28th of October, uh, I expressed my thoughts about what ought to happen. Uh, and I'll quote certainly from that particular uh, debate. And uh, I, I suggested at the time that I believe that the Smith Commission has to look at two key issues. The first one being what powers can be devolved to Scotland to bring about real social change to help us create a stronger economy uh, with more jobs whilst protecting public services. And the second being tackling inequality within our nation. The Smith Commission had that opportunity, but uh, I'm afraid it didn't go anywhere near tackling these issues. Uh, and the comments from Professor Michael Keating, 
um, indicate that uh, certainly well, this is, we will be discussing this tomorrow in the devolution uh, committee. Uh, he, he indicates that uh, proposals for devolution of welfare are piecemeal and lack coherence. I do welcome, though. I do. Okay. Drew Smith. To Mr. McMillan, presiding officer. I wonder if then does he agree with uh, Christine Graham that Mr. Swinney was wrong to sign the agreement? Stuart McMillan. With, uh, with uh, John Swinney and Linda Fabiani from signing an agreement because it was something that was done. But uh, as, as, as Mr Smith will recognise, there had to be compromises on all sides, as he indicated in his contribution earlier on. I do welcome the additional powers that, uh, that the Smith Commission actually does recommend comes to Scotland. And I'm going to, I will touch upon a couple of the positives. Paragraph 74, regarding the proliferation of the fixed odds betting terminals. Uh, the FOBTs. It's an issue that I've been campaigning on uh, and had a members' debate on this very subject earlier on this year. And I want to place them on record my thanks to all members who have been actually who've been supportive of this particular measure. And also I want to th uh, thank in particular Annabelle Goldie uh, for her support of that. Clearly the details of that particular measure are still to be ironed out, but this is an important first step and I will be paying particular attention uh, to the draft clause or clauses uh, when they're published in January. But the main issue about the FOBTs, however, is that the regulation will still remain at Westminster as gambling is still going to be reserved. The second positive is that concerning the franchise being extended to 16 and 17 year olds. Uh, that's already been discussed uh, today. And the third is that of paragraph, uh, well, the first part of paragraph 69, uh, the licensing of onshore oil and gas extraction or fracking uh, to come to Scotland. I'm concerned, however, at the timescale involved before we actually get the power. It's feasible, and it certainly is feasible, and everyone in this chamber will agree that the UK government could well have granted a large number of licences and the people of Scotland will have had no say on the applications by the time we actually get the powers. Alistair Carmichael, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, was clear about this last week in the Devolution Further Powers Committee when questioned on the introduction of the Smith recommendations. And he stated, I think the expectation at the moment is still that this will proceed as a package given the range of issues with which we are dealing and the somewhat tight time frame to which we are working. So although I welcome this power coming to Scotland, I do have the reservations. Uh, I don't have any more time, I'm sorry. Uh, I do want to highlight a couple uh, of negatives, though, which I think actually do merit some attention. Paragraph 39 uh, and uh, the formal consultative role for the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament in setting the strategic priorities for the Maritime Coast Guard Agency, the MCA, uh, with respect to its activities in Scotland. I genuinely welcome the Scottish Government having the power to appoint someone to the MCA advisory board and the Scottish Parliament actually being involved at committee level. However, two things have actually struck me about this particular proposal. The first one being that, well, the Scottish representative have actually been listened to and their recommendations acted upon. And secondly, when we consider how much the MCA has decreased in numbers in, in Scotland since 2010, with Coast Guard stations closing and their activities taking place elsewhere, such as the Clyde closing, with Belfast and Stornoway undertaking their work, uh, is this really just a sticking plaster approach to trying to appease areas where they've actually lost service personnel? Final I believe, minute. I believe that bringing the powers of the MCA to Scotland actually uh, could have provided Scotland with the opportunity to design our own coastal protection measures in conjunction with the services we currently possess. But unfortunately, this has been a missed opportunity. And the second point concerns the work programme. Paragraph 57 was clear that the Scottish Parliament will have all powers over support for unemployed people. And it goes on to, at the end of it, says, on expiry of the current commercial arrangements. Last week we heard that this contract has been extended. And during the devolution for the Powers Committee last Thursday, I asked the, the Secretary of State the following. Was Lord Smith made aware of the extension when he was going through the process? The Secretary of State replied by saying, I don't know. Why would the UK government actually keep Lord Smith in the dark over an issue of importance such as this? And it begs the question, if the UK government can do this on employment provision, what else have they actually done it with? So certainly, it's, I don't think uh, the, the report is actually measured up to my two recommendations in, in the, the debate we had in October. But I do, uh, certainly I'm going to support the amendment in the name of John Swinney this afternoon. Thank you. And I now call Patrick Harvey to be followed by John Mason. Well, I am shocked, Deputy Presiding Officer. Some people, it seems, look at this document and see a promise exceeded or over-delivered and other people look at the same document and say the promise has been broken and that they're underwhelmed. Who could have guessed that it would end that way? Who could have guessed? 
Of course it was going to end that way, not only because we were on different sides of the independence debate just a couple of months ago, but also because it's being measured against a deliberately vague and ill-defined promise. It even avoided using sketchily defined terms like Devo Max. It used like Devo Max. It used entirely undefined terms and was then pumped up in the media and in town hall debates to make people think that something much more substantial and defined had been promised. Can I also just deal with the question about whether we all signed it off, whether we all signed on the dotted line. If I remember rightly, we were asked to sign one copy as a souvenir for Tavish Scott, but the actual formal process, and we were happy to do so. We were happy to do so. I, I hope it has pride of place uh, framed on his wall somewhere. Uh, but the actual formal process was, as was described earlier, a negotiation. Obviously, myself, Mr Swinney, Ms Fabiani, and others would have taken a maximalist approach and would have tried to persuade others to come as far as possible on a range of issues. And some would have taken a lot of persuasion to get, come even this far. And this is what resulted. It's not a contract. It's not anything that someone has signed on the dotted line saying, this is the best for Scotland. It's what came out of a process of haggling and negotiation. Let's accept that that's its nature. Ruth Davison says that this has been a process of fast-forward constitutional reform. I think during the process of trying to reach uh, this, this final report, this final position, uh, that was part of the problem, the fast-forward nature of it, the breakneck speed, the inability that we had to take proper, reflective evidence, to take the time to look at the, the arguments uh, in depth uh, and, and in a reflective way. But now that the report has been published, it's clear that there is a need uh, for a multi-speed approach. There will be issues, like votes at 16, which require to be dealt with in a speedy way if we're going to do what the report says we should be able to do and have this change in time for the 2016 election. That can't wait for, for a, a full package of legislative proposals. There will also be aspects that can't be included in the, in the clauses that are going to be produced by the end of January because some aspects will require ongoing negotiation between the two governments, like the framework for borrowing powers. That's going to require further detailed negotiation between the two governments, and it would be quite unreasonable to expect the detail of that to be published by the end of January. So there is clearly going to be a multi-speed approach. And I, far from what Drew Smith suggested, that uh, the Section 30 idea on votes at 16 is, is somehow seeking unnecessary grievance. Quite the contrary. I think it's simply pointing out the most sensible and straightforward approach. Drew Smith. Mr Harvey, forgive me to give the opportunity to clarify that. We have said that we support a Section, th section 30 process for votes at 16, and indeed Margaret Curran has gone further and said that we would be prepared to consider other areas where primary legislation um, wouldn't be required. So that is not what I was arguing. Patrick Harvey. That's helpful. I'm, I apologise if I misheard or, or misinterpreted what was said earlier. One of the phrases that, that Labour have used consistently uh, is powers for purpose. And I've, I've argued that it's one that should be relevant to all of our approaches to this, this debate. But of course, we have different purposes in mind. When we think about the powers that, that devolution should move on to, the powers that should come to this Parliament, we have different purposes in mind. Some focus on the idea of financial accountability, as though the constraints which will still exist from UK government economic policy simply lead to economic decisions being implemented on their behalf in Final Scotland. Minute. Others, uh, the SNP, for example, might have purposes different from my own in relation to corporation tax. I would argue even if we were independent, we should take an EU-wide approach to corporation tax to cut down the loopholes for tax avoidance. And I would certainly like to end the situation where the aviation industry is one of the most undertaxed industries that we have in this country. I know Mr Swinney won't agree with that. Others focus on the purpose of pooling and sharing resources, flying in the face of what I would say is the co coherent evidence that that's not what the UK economy does successfully. It does exactly the opposite. But finally, on the question of coherence and durability, as this has been something sought by the Commission, I have to say I'm doubtful. Uh, I, if devolution is a process, as others have argued, I have to say I don't think this will be the last bit of progress that we see. Uh, I don't know where that, that progress will lead to eventually, but this in time, I'm sure, presiding officer, will be seen as just one more little step in the road. Thank you.
I now call John Mason to be followed by Alex Rowley. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Very happy to follow Patrick Harvey, what I think was an excellent speech. Clearly, uh, there are some good things have come out of the Smith Commission. Uh, I particularly welcome full control of the rates and bans of income tax, uh, powers over internal Scottish elections, some benefits, licensing onshore oil and gas, and control of the number of payday loan shops and fixed odd betting terminals. But clearly all of this is nothing like home rule. Now, a lot of terms have been used, home rule being one of them. Uh, another one is Devo Max, which I have never really understood what that actually means. Uh, and another one, of course, is the federal system, uh, which, I, as I understand it, is more about how government structures work rather than how much power is decentralised to the individual state. But it does seem to me that home rule, which was mentioned as a promise before the election, the referendum, uh, is a pretty clear definition. Now, this was a term, home rule, that was used in the 1886 bill uh, for Ireland, and it listed 13 areas that would be reserved, uh, which were the status of the crown, war and peace, the defence of the realm, international treaties, dignities or titles of honour, the booty of war, international law, treason, alienage and naturalisation, trade, navigation or quarantine, the postal and telegraph service, beacons and lighthouses, coinage, and copyright. Now, these are obviously slightly outdated terms in some cases, but I think the point is pretty clear that we are talking about uh, controlling what is happening within our own country uh, and some things happening externally. As uh, David Steele said in 1983, the principle of home rule is different from devolution. Under home rule, sovereignty lies with the Scottish people and we decide when it is sensible to give powers to the centre on issues like foreign affairs and defence. Now, effectively, that is what Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man have. They have complete control over internal affairs and they write a cheque for the war in the Falklands or whatever. Now, some statements in the Smith Commission, I would have to say, are actually pretty meaningless. For example, paragraph 21, it talks about UK legislation will state that the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government are permanent institutions. Well, last time I looked, the UK Parliament was not able to do that. If they pass a law this year, it can be changed next year. There is no written constitution in the UK, major failing of the UK, and therefore they cannot deliver on that promise. Now, taxation. We've heard... It. I'm going to take one intervention, yes. Drew Smith. I'm grateful to Mr Mason. Just as an independently minded backbencher, I wondered whether he was uh, closer to Christine uh, Graham's view or to John Swinney's view on whether or not this document should have signed. Could I just simply ask him, would he have signed? John Mason. Uh, when the party sends me along to one of these negotiations, I'll, I'll make a decision then as to whether I'm signing. <laughs> uh, on taxation, uh, on taxation, uh, we have no movement in corporation tax or inheritance tax or capital gains tax or oil and gas or fuel duty or excise duties. And while I accept that full devolution of VAT is not possible, uh, I think we have to say that the assignment of revenues is very much second best. Now, at the Finance Committee, we had a variety of experts and academics arguing for and against different tax powers. Uh, for example, one argument was that it was sensible to go for land-based tax because the land cannot move, but that has been completely ignored. And despite more control over income tax, national insurance has been kept reserved. Yet we have heard much evidence that national insurance is effectively an income tax and is no longer really linked to pensions and benefits. Having full control of income tax and national insurance would have allowed the two to be combined, creating a much simpler system that I think would have helped employers in particular who collect both of them. And that is something I would have thought the Conservatives should have been supporting. Now, others have spoken about welfare, so I will not repeat that, but I would want to reiterate my disappointment about no devolution of the statutory minimum wage. Final minute. The living wage is always going to be voluntary, and we can only encourage or exhort people to do it. We cannot force it. Now, the issue that has been raised that we should uh, pursue subsidiarity and powers should not stop at Holyrood, but should go further down to council levels. Uh, and I'm certainly comfortable with that, but it does raise some questions. Uh, the Lib Dem amendment talks about local communities and local authorities, although Tavish Scott did clarify that he did see the two separately. Are there sufficient checks and balances at local council level? Are council committees strong enough to keep the executive under control? Not in Glasgow, I would suggest. 
Should Clackman and Shire, population 50,000, have the same powers as Glasgow, population 600,000? So we do have like, quite a lot of questions to go eh, on that. And would we give powers to community councils? Sometimes they don't actually want them. But I'm happy to support the recommendations of the Smith Commission. I still wonder very much if Westminster will implement them, eh, and they certainly do not go far enough. Thank you. Many thanks. Alex Riley to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. I rise to support the amendment uh, put forward in the name of Tavis Scott, and I'll, I'll come to that in a tack. But can I pick up, firstly, on the, the points that John Swinney did make? I think it is important um, that, that we do recognise that, as, as Lord Smith himself said, there had to be compromise and there would be parties that would want to go much further. Um, and he, as, as he said himself, this, this, this um, settlement might be enough for some parties and not for others. I would always go back to the late Donald Dewar, who said that, in his view, devolution was a journey. I genuinely believe that, that, that we are on the journey, and this is the next stage of that journey. And that's why, for me, it's crucial that we use the powers. And I think that will be the, the main campaign theme that, that I will work on as we move forward, is that we use the powers. We use the powers that we've got, and we have powers over health, education, transport, and justice and that we use the powers that are coming through Calman and additional borrowing powers, and that we then use the powers that will come um, through the Smith Commission over tax, over welfare and over jobs. And it will be important that we do that. I would want to reiterate the point that, that Drew Smith made, and that is that Margaret Curran, quite rightly, was saying at the weekend, we need to get on with this. And of course we do. And where negotiations can take place and where powers can be brought down further that are coming through, through through the Smith Commission, then we need to be able to, to move. I only have five minutes, sorry. We need to move and we need to be able to get on with that. And indeed, the UK Labour um, last week tabled um, an amendment to the infrastructure bill um, where, where, where they, were, they were putting forward an amendment to devolve licensing for fracking into this place, um, as, as that's part of the Smith Commission. So, absolutely, I would hope that all parties in here can work together and move forward in terms of getting those powers that can be brought to this um, Parliament as quickly as, as is possible. I would also want to pick up on a point that Ruth Davison made. Ruth Davison and others in the Conservative Party often talk about the, the, the pro-union parties. I certainly have never seen myself as pro-union. I'm pro-Scottish, and I believe that the best way forward for Scotland is to remain part of the United Kingdom, um, sharing and pooling resources where it's necessary, and taking powers where it's equally necessary. But to get to the point of the, the transfer of powers, not just to Holyrood, but as, as Tavis Scott talks about, the transfer of powers into local communities, um, I recently read The Common Wheel, and in the common wheel, they talk about um, that it's not just the poor that need a better Scotland. We all do. And I quote, they say, below the level of the Scottish Parliament, Scotland is one of the least democratic and most centralised countries in the devolved world. We have enormous distant local authorities that manage people's communities without involving them and often without listening to them. And indeed, that's a point I think that John Mason also raises in this parliament um, from time to time is that we need to devolve powers and devolve powers further. Bruce Crawford asked earlier um, what powers would you um, devolve? Well, in terms of, in terms of the, the work programme, for example, we would devolve the work programme, surely not just into this parliament, but much further down, because all the evidence is that local authorities are far more successful, and I quote my own authority, Fife Council, where over the last two and a half years, by investing in apprenticeships, they've actually created, working with business, over a thousand apprenticeships. So we need to look at getting more powers down to local government, but we also need to look at how we get more powers down to communities. I've actually always campaigned that I believe 
community councils with the right powers, you would see more interest. In my constituency, there has been recently elections for three community councils where there was community, enough interest in the community to create interest. Um, the local government debate tomorrow highlights that where you have more powers at a local level, the fourth tier of local government in Scotland, then you would have more interest and more people taking part. So let's be imaginative as we go forward. Let's work together to get the powers that's, that, that's down. It was disappointing that Mark Macdonald, for example, spent the first two and a half minutes of his speech talking about how underwhelmed he and Civic Scotland was. Let's start to look at using the powers, and as we move forward, if we need more powers, then that will be the next stage of devolution. But I think the Scottish people now want us to get on with it and do a job of work. Thank you very much. And I now call Dennis Robertson, after which we will move to closing speeches. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. I mean, Alex Rowley, uh, in his contribution, was talking about uh, Donald Dewar and the fact that uh, we were on this journey. Uh, and we are on this journey, uh, Presiding Officer, and, and devolution um, to the Scottish Parliament from Westminster um, is, is part of that journey. And the devolution from uh, the Scottish Parliament to local government is a journey that is also taking place. And, and I firmly believe that um, when some of the, the uh, speakers this afternoon were talking about a tax being devolved to Scotland, welfare being devolved to Scotland, the problem is, presiding officer, they're kind of misleading the public. And if we want to have this open and honest and frank debate with the uh, population of Scotland, Scotland's people. Let's be open and honest. The taxation that's coming to Scotland is less than 30%. The welfare coming to Scotland is less than 20%. Now, that might be fine for some. And to be perfectly honest, uh, presiding officer, uh, when we said we had to compromise in the Smith Commission, there was compromise. No one from the other parties in this chamber was going to agree with uh, John Swinney, Linda Fabiani and Patrick Harvey and move towards uh, independence. We knew that from the outset. But what we did hope was that there was perhaps going to be maybe further devolution to actually, actually make and hopefully prepare Scotland for being that better and much richer place. Uh, not at the moment, please. And, and I, I actually fully support the, the powers that we've got and the powers that are coming down. And I sincerely hope that the, the, the agreement that we have uh, to have those powers coming down. And I, I welcome Margaret Kern's intervention in the fact that those that can come to Scotland maybe that bit quicker should come to Scotland that bit quicker. I mean, that should be welcome, presiding officer. And I think we should all welcome those powers. But one, I think there's probably one section in our society... Uh, presiding officer that is probably disappointed in the outcome of the Smith Commission. And that is people when we're looking at the opportunities for employment. And it's people probably with disabilities. Because I can't actually remember maybe any speaker the, this afternoon mentioning the opportunities for those with disabilities coming into the employment market. And this is where I think the Smith Commission has, has fallen short maybe for, for that group of people. Because I think if employment law had been devolved to Scotland, uh, we, we'd probably have a better opportunity of making the sort of socially unjust aspect of what we have at present for people with disabilities getting back into the employment market um, that, than is currently being uh, a, brought forward within the Smith Commission. And I think Inclusion Scotland were right when they said that the, the, this process was um, a very quick process. And it was basically quick because it said it had to be quick. Uh, and this prevented, I suppose, this better or longer dialogue with, with uh, Civic Scotland to hear maybe from the people more about what the people felt that we should have devolved rather than just what we felt uh, through the, the five political parties within the Smith Commission came up with. So I actually feel for those, that, and, and, and if we look at the part of the welfare that has been devolved, if we look at the DLA moving to PIP, well, presiding officer, we, we've said that, you know, this process should be halted within the UK government at the moment. Nothing else should be moving towards the, the PIP because it's actually an unjust uh, settlement. The PIP has actually already, in, in some areas, disadvantaged many people with disabilities that were on DLA in the past. They no longer have that benefit. 
When we look at the work capability assessment, people are still being unjust, unjustly sort of, uh, assessed in terms of their capability for work. But they're given no alternative, presiding officer. And when, the U, and when the UK government uh, went ahead and, and, and closed a, areas like Remploy, for instance, without having an alternative for people, that was wrong, presiding officer. And if we're looking at trying to have respect, and, uh, 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 and, to, and this is what people with disabilities actually want, they actually want respect, they want the dignity, they want to go out to work, but they also need a process there to enable that to happen. The Smith Commission doesn't afford that, presiding officer. And I think that's unfortunate. I think that's an opportunity missed. And I sincerely hope that when the other parties and they're summing up, maybe we'd reflect on some of those aspects, that there are some opportunities missed. Yes, welcome what we have and welcome what we can do with what we have, but also maybe reflect on perhaps what we should or perhaps could have had to enable a fairer, more just, equal Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now turn to the closing speeches. And I call on Tavish Scott. Six minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I begin, naturally, by uh, thanking Lord Smith, the Secretariat, and indeed all the participants to that process, a number of whom are obviously in the chamber this afternoon. I haven't had a chance to do that uh, on the record before, and I want to just express uh, my appreciation, uh, I think, as uh, John Swinney said in an earlier uh, day on this matter, for, the, uh, for broadly the tone of how those uh, discussions uh, took place. Patrick Harvey was quite right. We weren't all going to get what we wanted, and, and obviously um, we came from completely opposing views as to the future constitutional settlement for this country. But uh, on the whole, I believe that uh, that uh, process had much to commend it in terms of actually having people sit down and talk reasonably about things that need to happen. This has been, uh, uh, in broad terms, a spirited debate about uh, a massively important uh, issue for the future uh, of our country. But I want to start by defending um, uh, the Cabinet Secretary and Linda Fabiani from the range of, of vigorous attacks they faced from their own side this afternoon. Um, it, does, it does seem very unfair to... to uh, to uh, Lynn Fabian, to John uh, Swinney, uh, to have to go through that. At least Christine Graham has been cr commendably clear about her position in opposing signing the agreement all, all together. Chris Christine is Parliament's great conspiracy theorist, but uh, uh, she certainly has given clarity to her benches on, on that. But other colleagues of hers, Rod Campbell, said there was nothing good in, in uh, the Smith Commission. I couldn't quite decide. I couldn't quite decide whether um, uh, couldn't quite decide whether uh, Mark Bedard was arguing for or against it through his contribution. And Stuart Mimberland, in fairness, did say there were some benefits, so I thought I suppose we all might observe he might need to tell his staff uh, that as well. Patrick Harvey was, uh, uh, was quite right uh, that uh, his signature is on my copy, and I therefore consider that he's met the vow. But, um, <laughs> Uh, but John Mason made a couple of good points. I don't understand what Devo Max means either, Mr. Mason, uh, uh, although I think it's independence, and I don't believe in that. So I, I suppose that's uh, uh, my starting. Let me make one other point. I thought uh, Mr. Mason made a good point about the permanence of the institution and uh, the debate about how you actually do that. Uh, I just observed that local government in Scotland feels the same way about us as, uh, as, the, uh, uh, as uh, we might uh, consider in terms of the, the role of how Westminster would give effect to what was a very clear recommendation. Uh, of, the, uh, of the Smith Agreement. And Dennis Robertson Sullivan, uh, Dennis Robertson, rather, I beg your pardon, that was someone else from a previous political life. Gosh, how, I don't know where, where his name came from there. Let me, let me quickly forget, let me, let me, let me quick, quick, quickly forget about that one. Yeah. Um, Dennis Robertson uh, raised, uh, raised the issue of a journey. The trouble for, for, for me, Mr. Robertson, on the journey about mm -hmm. the Scottish Parliament to the local government, it's been the wrong way round for the past seven years, and I'd like to, uh, to reverse uh, that. Linda Fabiani made one point that I completely agree with, and that's the public awareness no, I agree with lots of things you say, Linda. Uh, I agree with you on the public awareness of the Scottish Parliament uh, powers. Uh, Lord Smith observed that um, what we do in this place and have done in this place since 1999 uh, isn't terribly well understood, uh, and uh, there is a role uh, for Parliament in that, on education, health, transport, ag, fish. Indeed, on our law, it doesn't strike me when... Uh, Linda Fabiani was making that point that on our law, I can only just imagine what the reaction would have been of the, uh, of the, of the government here had a Secretary of State for Scotland in London proposed the abolition of corroboration, this is one of the central tenets uh, of Scots law uh, and all that has gone around that. Uh, let me also just briefly mention Civic Scotland. Uh, it's quite, uh, Mark Madon's quite entitled, as was of course the Cabinet Secretary, to quote uh, Civic Scotland and to use the examples, but so are the rest of us entitled to observe uh, Civic Scotland's uh, 
uh, uh, kind of, uh, Civic Scotland's um, position on, on lots and lots of issues. Uh, and I just uh, hope, and I'm sure the reasonable man that is the Cabinet Secretary would accept, there are two sides to that argument. And many uh, different organisations believe there's much to be done within Scotland, as well as the argument about powers uh, from uh, Westminster to uh, Holyrood. And in that regard, Alec Rowley set out a very fair test about the work programme and devolving that to a local level. I would, I would continue that process. I think that goes hand in hand with Skills Development Scotland. I think that's a big national quangle that doesn't work at a local level. And if uh, Bruce Crawford, who's no longer in his place, was asking me that question again, I'd make a strong argument for taking uh, Skills Development Scotland apart and devolving it to a local level. The advice that government ministers like Mr Swinney need should be, should be provided to him by that bit of the organisation that does that. But there's an organisation that is ripe for reform in Scotland that will provide, in my view, whether in Fife or in Shetland, a much better service for uh, sorting out the challenges around colleges, workplaces and schools that we uh, very badly uh, need. Can I just make a couple of other points uh, in closing? Uh, this is, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, as uh, Ruth Davidson said when she opened the debate, uh, absolutely for the future about the choices we will make uh, on tax, welfare and on the range of responsibilities that we will get. And that is a, that is a good thing. Now, I'm sure there will be a day when even the front bench of our government accept that it's a good thing because uh, they will, uh, as the government of course, be able to make those choices and be held to account uh, for them. And when uh, they propose a 50 pence top rate, ta top rate or whether it's a zero rate at the bottom to do something with personal allowances, those are all different and interesting choices that Parliament will uh, debate. And actually, when that starts to happen, I rather suspect that it won't just be Civic Scotland uh, engaged in a somewhat arbitrary debate about what powers here and what powers there. It'll be much, real, much more real uh, to many of us and to more to the point to our constituents uh, and to every man, woman and child right across uh, our country. Uh, Lord Smith said in his foreword uh, to his uh, agreement that taken together these new powers will deliver three important overarching improvements to the devolution settlement, <coughs> making it more responsive, durable and stable. And the only other observation I'd make, presiding officer, is I believe there is some work to be done in this place, in Parliament, about the accountability of ministers to this Parliament and about how our committee system works. It's not just about what happens outside, it's also about our own procedures in this place. Many thanks. And I now call on Ian Gray. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer, we've heard uh, a lot about the vow both today and uh, otherwise, largely from those who didn't make it, didn't support it, didn't believe that it would be delivered. Uh, but now, who seem very concerned with what it was, they've told us that it was uh, Devo Max, it was fiscal autonomy, it was full fiscal autonomy. <laughs> It was full fiscal federal autonomy with added Devo Mega Max. Uh, according to John Mason today, it's 19th century uh, home rule. I'm with Mr. Scott on this. I don't know what any of these things mean, and that's why none of them were promised. The fact is that the vow was simple. The Scottish Parliament, permanent and entrenched, the Barnet formula protected, and extensive new powers over tax and welfare. That could be a summary of the Smith Agreement. £20 billion worth of taxes and £2.5 billion of the welfare system coming to a parliament near us, and very soon 60% of our spending funded by taxes for which we have some responsibility. I'm, uh, yep, I'm Sorry, Patrick Harvey. grateful for the member for giving way. I agree with the, the earlier point that he made, that the, the promise was ill-defined, and that's a, a point that I made myself, but he mentions the permanence of the Parliament. Does he not acknowledge that that is something that can't be achieved in the absence of a written constitution in anything other than a symbolic way? It cannot be legally delivered. Thank you. At, at the very least, we can look at the original Scotland Act and remove the clause which says the, the Westminster Parliament remains sovereign over the Scottish Parliament. And I think that may be symbolic, but it's also significant. The Scottish Parliament, not just made permanent, but also made responsible for ourselves the imbalance between legislative and fiscal competence redressed. A parliament rebalanced, a parliament transformed, a parliament empowered. The fact is that the Smith Agreement is the vow delivered on time and in spades. And I am glad, I am glad that the government amendment tonight finds something positive about the Smith Agreement to say. Uh, because uh, most SNP speakers have had nothing good to say about it from one miserable contribution to the next. And indeed, the SNP reaction to Smith has been dismal. 
The Deputy First Minister participated in it and agreed it and then denounced it from the platform at the launch. And even before that, the First Minister herself was busy in her office through the night trashing Smith by tweet. And at FMQs uh, that day, she warmly welcomed it and then rubbished it. Meanwhile, the former First Minister is touting himself around a government not yet elected <laughs> in a parliament he is not yet a member of, offering demand and supply agreements in return for enhancements to the Smith Agreement. We could be forgiven for asking not just what the SNP position on Smith is, but actually who speaks for the SNP uh, on the Smith Agreement. No wonder some Nationalist councillors were so confused that they ended up burning a document with their own Deputy First Minister's name on it, agreeing to bring more powers to Scotland. It's just as well, just as well they didn't decide to burn the Smith Commissioners in effigy because they would have been a bit surprised, I think, when they got to Linda Fabiani and John Swinney. Although Linda Fabiani seems today to be a little unsure that she was actually there uh, at the Smith Commission. And Christine Graham has told her in no uncertain terms that she should not have been. <laughs> these, are, these are substantial powers. Order, please. These are substantial powers. And with the Smith Agreement, we can, if we choose, reintroduce a 50p tax rate for top earners, a 10p rate to help lower earners. We can redesign the work programme to get people into work more effectively, redeploy hundreds of millions of pounds worth of disability benefits to re-inject dignity and respect into the system. And that includes, Mr Robertson, the Work Choices programme to help people with disabilities into employment. We can attack child poverty by supplementing child benefit for families under stress, reform carers' allowance, give carers the rights they deserve, and finally match attendance allowance and DLA to our own Scottish system of care of the elderly. In fact, Smith will enable us to create new benefits of our own, something currently disallowed by the Scotland Act. Thus, we can construct, if we wish, a whole new Scottish welfare system of benefits of our own design, built on the guarantee of UK-wide provision of pensions social security and child benefit. Any politician, any politician who Members thinks these are minutes. limited powers simply lacks imagination. Indeed, any politician who looks at this package of powers and can see only what it does not give them simply reveals themselves to be more concerned with gratuitous grievance than with effective government on behalf of the people. And any government who thinks that the most important thing about these new powers is not what we can do with them, but who gets to write the draft legislation which gives us them has simply got the wrong priorities. <laughs> Mr Swinney said he wants to use these powers, but first he has to talk about the process of implementation. Isn't that the whole problem with this government? There's always something they have to talk about first. For five years, they had to talk about a referendum. For two years, they had to talk about independence. And now they're going to talk about the implementation of Smith. Scotland has had two years of a government claiming they can do nothing without independence. It cannot take another year of a government claiming it can do nothing until Smith is implemented. It is time to get on with the job now. Thank you. Now, Colin John Swinney, eight minutes, Deputy First Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, Tavis Scott accused my uh, dear, long standing friend, Christine Graham, of being Parliament's conspiracy theorist. <laughs> and I just want to add to a further level of conspiracy uh, to which Patrick Harvey began giving some details. Uh, I don't know about Patrick Harvey, but I signed two copies of the Smith Commission report. Maybe Patrick Harvey wasn't invited to sign the other one, because I signed a copy of the Smith Commission, not only for Mr Scott, but I also charitably did one for Mr Gray into the bargain. If Mr, if, if Mr Harvey was left off that one, maybe that exempts him from being a signatory to all of the agreement. I'm not sure. But I'm happy to confirm to Parliament today that I was a signatory to these two copies and that I agreed the contents of the Smith Commission report. And that is the position of the Scottish Government. And we're happy to take forward the proposals in the Smith Commission report. But it would be a fundamentally dishonest position 
For me to stand in the National Museum of Scotland, or more importantly, in the National Parliament of Scotland, and say this is the summit of my, all of my ambitions, because that would be a dishonest manifestation of the position. It might be the position, well, it is the position, I don't know if it's actually the summit of all the ambitions of the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives and the Labour Party, but it's not the summit of my ambitions. And people should not disrespectfully suggest that par parties who honestly hold views that are different to others should somehow recant on things they have believed for every moment of their adult life. That is just hypocrisy. Now, what I want to do is... Of course, I'll give way to this. Gavin Brown. Perfectly fair point he makes, but does he acknowledge, though, and will he say publicly, that taken together, the package is significant? John Swinney. No, I won't say that, Mr Brown. And, and the reason why I won't say that is because it doesn't say that in the agreement. It doesn't say in the agreement this is... It says, it says this is a new range of powers. I'm quite happy to say this is a new range of powers. It's additional powers. It doesn't say in this agreement that it's significant. So I'm not going to say anything that's not in the agreement, Mr Brown. That is my answer to your point. Uh, I'll give way to Mr Campbell. Roger Campbell. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree, however, it is progress? John Swinney. Well, yeah, yes, it is. And that brings, up, that brings me on to a really another interesting part of the discussion which has been advanced today. Because everybody's been... Uh, in the, in the unionist parties has been saying just how much of a, a process devolution is and how much this is another step in the journey. Of course, if it's another step in the journey, there must be, by definition, some further destination. So there therefore must be an acceptance. And I'll give way in a second, Mr Macdonald, because I'm just coming to the remark that you made. Mr Macdonald, I think, said, if I wrote it down correctly, and he has the opportunity in a moment to correct me, this was another step on the journey to get a fit-for-purpose constitutional settlement. And that is a, an observation I am happy to endorse. Lewis MacDonald. Well, I, I'm, I'm very glad that Mr Swinney does so, because what I was saying very clearly, I hope, was that the fit-for-purpose constitutional settlement that the Smith Agreement helps to deliver is a stronger Scottish Parliament in a stronger United Kingdom. Deputy First Minister. Well, that, 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 that's, if that's Mr Macdonald's view, fine. But one of the other clauses I signed up to in the Smith Agreement, it would, I'll, I'll come on to you in a second, Mr Smith. Uh, one of the other clauses that I signed up to in the, uh, in the Smith Commission is Clause 18. It is agreed that nothing in this report prevents Scotland becoming an independent country in the future should the people of Scotland so choose. So, yes, to respond to Mr Campbell's point, this is progress. It is more powers. It gives us more responsibility. It gives us more scope for action. Is it the sum of all my ambitions? No, it's not. And yes, I do intend to make sure that we reach the destination set out in section 18 of the report. I'll give way to, I, don't, I, I said I would give way to Mr Smith if he wishes it, and, and then I'll give way to Mr Green. Drew Smith. Drew Smith's microphone, please. Uh, thank you, President. Officer. You, you said that uh, Mr McDonald's description of a stronger uh, Sc uh, Scottish Parliament and a stronger United Kingdom was his position. Does he not accept it was actually the position that was voted for by the majority of people in Scotland? And it is the, the SNP's bad faith and poor tone in response to the entire Smith Commission process that undermines people's belief that they genuinely do accept that result. Deputy First Minister. See, I, 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 I think I've never for a moment, not for one single moment, since the 18th of September, tried to represent anything other than the fact that we did not win the referendum. I accept that entirely. I've never, for a moment, and there is not... Please don't get your researcher, Mr Smith, to go off and traipse through the internet to try and find a quote from me that somehow contradicts that. There will be none. I can save them the bother right away. I have always accepted the outcome of the referendum. But... In and, 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 by Order, please. and by demonstrating it, I took part in the Smith Commission. Why, is, why are all these three UK parties doing cartwheels Order, about Smith. this beautiful moment when all five political parties got together in the one room for the first time? Apparently that was a moment of great celebration. It happened because I accepted the outcome of the referendum, but I want to move on from that outcome to deliver a settlement that will meet the ambitions and the needs of the people of Scotland. And that is my democratic right to do exactly that. And the Labour Party can't take it away from me. Now, I've also been criticised this up. Uh, I'll, well, I, OK, I better give way to Mr. Green. 
Ian Gray. I simply want to make the point that paragraph 18 to which he refers is exactly the point at which Smith recognises absolutely Mr Swinney's democratic right to continue to argue for independence. We simply ask, can he not find one positive good thing to say about the agreement he was part of? John Swinney. Mr Gray, Mr Gray was sitting about three or four seats away from me on the platform at the National Museum of Scotland a couple of weeks ago when I said these words. We welcome the new powers that will come to Scotland. Greater control over income tax, APD, blah, blah, blah. We welcome these powers as we support all progress for Scotland. Was Mr Gray not listening on that particular <laughs> occasion? Now, a lot of, a lot of a, a criticism has been levelled at me in this debate by the fact that I want to concentrate on the translation of some of the, uh, the principles in the Smith Commission into the detail of legislation. And I suppose the conspiracy theory element is that somehow I think we're going to get um, a, we won't get turned into legislative reality what's in the Smith Commission agreement. Well, we had one example of the dangers on th uh, last Thursday. At the Devolution of Further Powers Committee, the Secretary of State for Scotland said that the extension of the Crown Estate responsibilities would go to 12 miles. That is what the Secretary of State for Scotland said. Now, the Smith Commission members know full well because we debated this ad infinitum, that in the wording that we used, and specifically because of the terminology that we put into the Smith Agreement at Clause 33, we made specific provision for the fact that the, 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 the area of the seabed covered in the devolution of the Crown Estate was to go to 200 miles. That was absolutely crystal clear. So I want to make sure. Now, there we've got an example within a week of the Smith Commission report happening where the Secretary of State for Scotland represented a position at odds with the contents of the Smith Commission report. Is it any wonder that I want to make sure that we are close to the drafting of this legislation to make sure what the Smith Commission meant is turned into practical reality in the legislation that we form? That is not an unreasonable position. That's called protecting the interests of the people of Scotland. Thank you very much. And I now call on Gavin Brown to wind up the debate. Ten minutes, please, Mr Brown. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Today has been, I think, a very important debate. And it hasn't been a good day, I have to say, for the Scottish Government. Yeah. I think the Scottish Government have genuinely struggled all the way through this debate. And it's no wonder they didn't want a debate on their time. They just wanted a statement where they could have an uninterrupted 20-minute rant followed by friendly questions from backbenchers asking them very gentle things about the Smith Commission. Now, I am staggered that nobody in the Scottish Government, and even the usually reasonable Cabinet Secretary and Deputy First Minister, could bring themselves to say that the Smith Agreement represents a significant package of powers. It does, Deputy Presiding Officer. Ruth Davidson read out a list of powers being transferred and devolved. She actually had to stop because she was going to run out of time if she would carried on with the powers being devolved. But many of them represent, represent individual significant powers. There is no bigger tax. There is no bigger tax than income tax, Deputy Presiding Officer, unless John Mason can rebut that point. John Mason. The member accepts that it is nowhere remotely close to home rule. Gavin Brown. This comes from the member who didn't know what home rule was. He didn't know what autonomy was. He didn't know what federalism was. And he's deputy convener of the finance committee, a deputy a presiding officer. Individually, there are significant powers within there, with income tax, I think, being the largest. But taken as a package, how can any fair, reasonable-minded person say that this is not significant? We've heard some backbenchers describe the entire package as de minimis. They don't think the entire package, billions of pounds, is significant. Yet just a few weeks ago, the Scottish Government was saying that the legal writings, counterparts and delivery Scotland bill gave us a significant competitive <laughs> advantage. <laughs> sure, of course. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful. I, I think most things in life carry some significance. Does he, does he think it's significant that some people saw fit to do the hokey-cokey with the welfare system? 
Gavin Brown. I'm glad that Mr Harvey at least can accept the significance in this. But let's move on to the important point, because in a, in a, serious, in a serious measure, let's look at how significant the powers actually are. Because anybody looking at devolution across the planet, across the ages, has generally looked at three things. The control of expenditure, the control of revenues, and the control of legislative power. And I think it's only right that we look at all three to look at how important the powers are and what kind of a parliament it actually gives. Let me make some progress, and I, and I will give way to Mr Macmillan. Every analyst on the planet talks about control of expenditure and control of revenue. Control of expenditure being one of the key measures. But the Scottish Government, since the publication of the Smith Report, not one of them has talked about control of expenditure. They only want to talk about control of welfare expenditure, as if that's the new measure, the only one that matters, instead of control of expenditure as a whole. We have strong powers on expenditure, Deputy Presiding Officer. Actually, always, we always have. It was high before the Smith Agreement, but with the addition of many welfare powers, whether that's attendance allowance, carers allowance, disability living allowance and so on, the best part of £3 billion. It means that post-Smith agreement, if you go by the 12-13 JERS figures, we will be in control of £36.8 billion of a total Scottish expenditure of £65 billion. According to SPICE, the Scottish Parliament and Government will be in control of 56% of expenditure within Scotland. That is a significant amount, Deputy Presiding Officer. And how do we compare to other countries across the world? Well, rather helpfully, Professor David Bell of Stirling University produced a graph plotting countries against each other to see how we compare on decentralisation ratios. And yes, Deputy Presiding Officer, he was able to find three countries on the planet that had higher decentralisation ratios than us. Canada, Denmark, and Switzerland, perhaps the new arc of autonomy, uh, Deputy <laughs> uh, Presiding Officer. But also on that chart, it showed that we were ahead of the rest of the OC OECD countries, including Sweden, Germany, Norway, Spain, Finland, Belgium, Austria, the Netherlands, Iceland, France, Portugal, Ireland, Greece. Yes, Belgium. Yes, Ireland. That's what I said. They are very good, very good, Deputy Presiding Officer. And Italy uh, to add in too. So there were only three. And most of them were just ahead of us out of those three. If you look at control of revenues, Deputy Presiding Officer, where I have to say, where I have to accept, there was a weakness in the system with the original Scotland Act. There was. But that has changed, and that will change over the course of the Smith Agreement. I think there was a vertical fiscal imbalance, to use the uh, technical term. Initially, we just had council, rates, council tax and business rates. That was improved by the Scotland Act 2012, and that improves vastly now. It takes us from a position, Deputy Presiding Officer, Presiding Officer sorry, uh, in being in charge of £4 billion worth of revenues to one where we will be in charge of around £20 billion worth of revenues. Presiding Officer, the Smith revenues as a percentage of Scottish Government spending means we will be in charge of 55% of the revenues for which we spend, according to SPICE. And in the um, spirit of fairness and completeness, because I think we'd have to put the whole package on the table, the Smith revenues as a percentage of total Scottish revenues would be 38%. But again, comparing us, uh, people scoff, presenting officer, but again, let's compare how we do internationally. And again, David Bell of Stirling University has plotted on a graph how that compares using the 38% figure. Again, it has, in, one, in one moment, it has Canada ahead of us, it has Switzerland ahead of us, and this time it has Spain ahead of us. But all of the other 14 OECD countries on the graph are below us. And I'll happily give way to Mr McKenzie. Mike McKenzie. Um, I'm grateful to the member for taking the intervention, but I'm struggling to understand why a percentage point here or there in terms of taxation uh, powers and powers over revenue is important. Surely it is the ability of uh, taxation to work together um, to improve economic growth and create wealth that is important. I would be interested to hear his explanation on that. Gavin Brown. I, I, I suspect, I suspect uh, Mr McKenzie needs more than my help, uh, uh, <laughs> presenting officer, in order to get through this. But I have to say, I do not think 20 
billion pounds worth of control over revenue is insignificant. I wouldn't describe it as just a percentage point or two. Maybe he does. But I was drawing an international comparison on a graph that is pretty stark, where there were only three countries who had a greater decentralisation ratio than Scotland would have under the Smith Agreement. That was Canada, Switzerland and Spain. All of the other countries plotted on that graph were either below us or significantly below us that shows that this is a serious package of powers, both in terms of expenditure and in terms of revenue too. And David Bell, in his conclusion to his article, no thank you, David Bell, in the conclusion to his article, said this, Implementing Smith will mean that in terms of fiscal federalism, Scotland will be closer to Canadian provinces and Swiss cantons, which are at the extreme end of the spectrum of devolved fiscal powers among OECD countries. Presiding officer, that may not be what the nationalists want. They are perfectly entitled to crave and campaign for independence. But what they cannot say, what nobody can say in any objective, in one, in any objective capacity, is to say that this is a de minimis package of powers and that it's not significant. I said twice I would give way to uh, Mr McMillan, so I'll do so. Uh, Gavin Brown for taking the intervention and uh, he mentioned Professor Bell but also Professor Michael Keating uh, suggested that the proposals for devolution of welfare are piecemeal and lack coherence uh, in, in a submission. Does he agree with Professor Keating? Gavin Brown. Okay. He's managed to find an academic that disagrees but what he hasn't managed to do and I have to say what no SNP member has managed to do since the Smith Commission was published and over the course of the afternoon today is to actually suggest countries other than Canada, Switzerland and Spain that are, have a greater decentralisation ratio than Scotland would have under these proposals. Presiding officer, the third element, of course, is control of legislation, where we have always had great powers, and, of course, where those powers are extended again through the Smith Agreement. So, in closing, presiding officer, I'm glad we brought this debate forward today. I think we pointed out very clearly that these powers really do mean something. They make a big change, and in terms of international comparisons, they're very, very difficult to beat. And on that basis, it's time for the Scottish Government to get on with things from their end so that we can actually start making a difference to people in Scotland. That's what people want. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the Smith Commission. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 11832 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11832. Moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 11832 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of three Parliamentary Bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11833 on the designation of a lead committee and motion numbers 11834 and 11835 on approval of SSIs. Moved on block. The questions on these motions will be put at decision time to which we now come. There are six questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members that in relation to today's debate, if the amendment in the name of John Swinney is agreed, the amendment in the name of Tavish Scott falls. The first question then is amendment number 11830.2 in the name of John Swinney, which seeks to amend motion number 11830 in the name of Ruth Davidson on the Smith Commission be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11830.2 in the name of John Swinney is as follows. Yes, 64. 
No, 49. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to, and the amendment in the name of T Tavish Scott falls. The next question is at motion number 11830, in the name of Ruth Davidson, as amended on the Smith Commission, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 11830 in the name of Ruth Davidson as amended is as follows. Yes, 62. No, 48. There were three abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11833 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the designation of a lead committee be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11834, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on approval of an SSI, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11835, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on approval of an SSI, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members should leave in the chamber, should do so quickly and quietly.